Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. What's up? We got the drink. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God. You made it. Yay. It's about time, Nathan. Damn. Shh. The movie's starting. Well, my name's Oppenheimer, and I'm here to say <laughs> it's sad to test in a nuclear way. <laughs> and uh, my name's Dustin, and I'm not just self-important. I'm actually important. <laughs> And I'll bet the Japanese didn't like this. Uh, this is the Silver Linings Playlist, a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of the most extreme close-ups of Killian Murphy. We're starting off hot. Yeah. We're starting off real hot. Yeah. Holy boy. <laughs> oh, boys. Get a reaction right at the top, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know where to start. Yeah. I don't know where to start. Probably with Fission. Probably with Fission. Maybe we'll go over to Fusion. Who knows? But uh, I got to say, much like when we talked about Judas, I am so... Intimidated? I am so worried about this episode. Uh-huh. Not because I think we're going to cross any like moral qualms or anything like that. Right. But <laughs> well... <laughs> I took the most notes I've ever taken for an episode. Yeah. I don't want to say the number because I feel like Mally will log out immediately <laughs> from this phone call. I mean, I took notes, mm. so that's a win. I got to say, like, this was one of the movies where I found myself for long stretches realizing I wasn't taking notes yeah. and then having to rewind because I get so sucked into this movie. I'm also nervous about talking about this film mainly because I think this movie... <laughs> are you also ha- are troubled by visions of a hidden universe? <laughs> Absolutely. And I can hear the music. I was going to say, are you also a crybaby? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am. I am. But I-, I feel like this movie, more than many others in recent memory, just sort of reminded us that media literacy is dead. Yeah. Um, yep. We were talking about Dune 2 off mic, mm-hmm. a film that came out the weekend we're recording this, that people seem to be leaving the theater with the impression that the message of Dune 2 is either never give up or um, actually, if you think about it, Paul Atreides isn't like a really good guy. Like, no shit. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it is, uh, it's just truly wild that like uh, I just feel like there's so many bad faith arguments. Welcome to the point of the film. Yep. <laughs> yep. So this was the film, if I remember correctly, this was the film that kicked off the... The, the sex scene discourse? Yeah, exactly. I was going to say the quote-unquote unnecessary sex scene discourse. Sure. To which I say, don't watch movies anymore. Don't. <laughs> the sex scene in this movie, there's two mm-hmm. that I can recall. They are both so fucking important, yeah. not only to the film itself, but to the characters within the film. Like, yeah. You can't have fission without friction. <laughs> you exactly. cannot. You can't. But also, <laughs> one of them is a uh, viscerally upsetting projection from a character's mind yes. that tells you so much about where they are at exactly. in themselves. Yeah. 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 I, I can't believe that. I guess let's start start right away with the Barbenheimer effect, right? Hell yeah. Because what a time. Oh my God. I can't ugh. I can't I'm oh man, boys, we're gonna be telling our grandkids about this shit. Yes. Genuinely, like yeah. we I don't think we will ever get something no. like that. We tried to force it with Saw Patrol. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But like as organic as that came together, uh-huh. like it truly was, especially after the pandemic after the fiasco with Tenet and all this other stuff like to see something like that come together so naturally mm-hmm. and for it not only to just become a meme but to translate into physical butts in the seat yes. physical dollars both these movies basically making a billion dollars each yes and feeling compelled like even if you thought it was just a joke and yeah. you were only in it for Barbie or if you were, you were only in it for Oppenheimer being like well I gotta I gotta see the next one right I gotta right. see the other one and I was so fucking excited when that happened yes. and I I think it has kicked off this new wave of people wanting to go to the theater and not be talked down to in a dumb way. Like, this movie almost, like, it didn't quite hit a billion, I don't think. Almost. Yeah. But... It's a three-hour movie of dudes talking. Yep. It, is, it is a movie that, yes, it made blockbuster money, and, like, the big, I mean, quote-unquote, set piece of the film is someone having their security clearance revoked. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> John Waters said it best. He said, this was the first action blockbuster that is just three hours of people talking. Yes. Yeah. That's really what it is. Aaron Sorkin wishes he could. He's so <laughs> mad right now. <laughs> like, my favorite part of all of that is that, like, they were promoting this, like, see it on the biggest screen mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Nolan trolled all of us because it's just close-ups of Killian Murphy. Sure. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And, like, we all paid for the IMAX. Sure, <laughs> sure. But, like, 
I don't know where to even begin with like celebrating this movie because sure. I was someone who saw Barbenheimer. I did the double feature. Yeah. Saw Barbie 10, 11 in the morning, had lunch, and then went and saw Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. And I thought I was going to feel the fatigue in Oppenheimer, obviously, after seeing Barbie and loving it. And then, of course, taking the break and going right back to a three hour movie. Yeah. And not once did I like check my watch did i do anything i was glued because for a three-hour movie of people talking it it moves it moves it's impressive what he's able to do in only three hours yeah like i i would watch a five-hour cut of the movie (laughs) (laughs) i think it's worth saying i think you watch them in the right order too because when you finish this movie you're this is like the ultimate silver linings movie right like you finish this movie and you're like what's the fucking point i know (laughs) of of anything else (laughs) what am i gonna go to barbie land after this I mean, I guess we'll say this too. We are recording this the weekend or two weekends before the Oscars. Yeah. And when this episode comes out, it will be a week out from the Oscars. So I think what I'm going to try and do is have us kind of reconvene towards the end of the episode okay. to talk about the Oscar snubs and flubs. And I'm sure what's going to be Oppie Sweep. Like, <laughs> I just am expecting this thing to just clean the fuck up. Sweepenheimer. Sweepenheimer. That's a way better, <laughs> <laughs> way better portmanteau. That's why Nathan makes the big bucks. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh-huh. This is why. But like, this movie, I I saw it when I saw Barbie and it immediately became like, this is the best movie of the year. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think this is going to get topped even by killers. I don't think it's going to top it. Oh, killers didn't stand a fucking chance. Are you kidding me? Not a shot. And I love killers of the flower moon. Maybe number three for me. It was fun. Bo is afraid is still my favorite movie from last year, but Oppie is clearly the best. Like, let's not even fuck around. Killers of the flower moon is a devastating film, but I don't, I don't know that it's, propelled me quite yeah. like watching this one did sure. I, 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 yeah they're they're definitely accomplishing very different things i mean lily gladstone is trying her best to carry that movie and she's succeeding almost every shot she has yes and i don't see a universe where that's not the best actress win like i yeah and greta lee is maybe number two but sure. very close behind her from past lives but uh you know i saw the movie the one time in theaters i was like this is great fucking love it best movie to hear mm-hmm. and i hadn't watched it again until this rewatch me neither and this rewatch for me was a fucking baptism <laughs> like i poured myself a couple glasses of whiskey yeah and the kids were away the old slapped on some sunscreen <laughs> the old lady was away and man I put this movie on and you just took your pants off. It fucking destroyed me. This movie Jerkenheimer. <laughs> God fucking damn it. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> this movie took me four hours to get through because mm-hmm. I kept having to pause it and take notes yeah. and Google things uh, and like the, the three hour movie took you four hours. It sure fucking did. And I loved every second of it. But then when just I did because Kenneth Branagh's in it doesn't mean it has to be as long as Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But what I did do is I put it on for a third time late last night. Mm. I'm talking late. Like I didn't finish it till like one in the morning. Yeah. And as three men in their thirties, that is fucking late. That's it late. Is. <laughs> it's late. It is. Couldn't be me. I was like, I'm just going to put it on this time and just absorb it. Just mm. let it wash over me. And I found myself fucking taking notes again. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't help myself. I was like, this movie needs to be studied like on a frame by frame case. Like yeah. if there was ever an excuse for a Twitter account that's Oppenheimer frame by frame. It's this one. Like, well, and I, I, I feel like that's a lot. A lot of bad faith arguments have been made by people who are refusing to meet the film where it is, yeah. right? Like, we, yeah. we talked about this uh, earlier this season with, with Judas and the Black Messiah, where there are a lot of arguments against the fact that despite the film being named Oppenheimer, the movie should have focused on a lot of other people. Yeah. And there's all these think pieces about, you know, the movie tells us about all the people who were killed, but why don't we see them? And, you know, I'm like, isn't that more exploitative? Thank and also, you. in fact, those movies exist. Yeah. Yes. You know, with, yeah. we, you know, we've got Barefoot Jin and The Bells of Nagasaki, a yep. film called Hiroshima that you can watch, all yep. of which are made by Japanese filmmakers. I'm sorry, don't you mean Nagasaki? No, Nagasaki. We, I, I, I could talk for eight <laughs> hours about Gary Oldman. <laughs> I, I fear that's what's going to happen is this episode's going to be the longest one we've ever fucking done. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry ahead of time to anyone that's just tuning in for the first time. This is our magnum opus. Uh, so speaking of magnum opus, this is Nolan's perfect film. Like, right. this is, for me, number one with a bullet as much as i loved interstellar oh, sorry. Did, did you just quote fallout boy i to- sure did okay. i sure fucking did huh 
don't see that on my Oppenheimer discussion bingo card. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I don't I don't see a second of this movie wasted. Mm. Everything I, I don't find any flaws, but this is a hundred percent perfect movie for me. And I again I'm worried that this is gonna devolve into hey, that scene was fucking great. That sure. line of dialogue cuts deep. This performance is the best thing I've ever seen, but that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, DC, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there are things that I, I, I grappled with in this film, and then I would sort of come back around on it the more I thought about it, right? Mm-hmm. Like on a first viewing, I was dis- disappointed in Kitty's characterization. Sure. I was kind of disappointed in the way that the the two female leads, quote unquote, of the film are sort of pushed to the side. But then also, when you grapple with the fact that this is a subjective viewpoint from Oppenheimer, their treatment in the movie informs more about who he is, right? Exactly. There is a point to the black and white nature of this movie. Like When we're cutting to black and white, that is objective fact. Yes. That is out outside Oppie's viewpoint. Right. When we cut the color, that is all how he perceives things. And that's why Kitty is pushed to the side. That's yes. why Florence Pugh is considered like this manic, depressive person is because that's how he viewed her. He saw her as this unknowable challenge. Exactly. Kitty was like a representation of this nuclear family that he didn't want. Literally nuclear family. <laughs> nuclear, I mean, yeah, no, no pun intended, but thank you. And the thing that's so interesting about Oppenheimer himself in this movie and that lends itself to the narrative is that he is this fundamentally broken person who has studied human behavior just enough that he can pass himself off like a person every once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I think it's best to get all this stuff out of the way before we actually get into the movie itself, but just from an outsider's perspective looking at Oppenheimer the man Mm -hmm. and looking at how this movie represents him, I think the whole point of this movie is, and the reason why we don't see the Japanese destruction firsthand is because this man is so broken from moment one. Like, the first frame of the movie is him looking at those raindrops Mm -hmm. and first of all brilliant fucking foreshadowing for where that lands in the movie but that man is clearly experiencing something that not many of us can grapple with and that is literally the burden of genius yes like einstein is probably the only one in this movie that fully gets what oppie is enduring Mm -hmm. and niels board maybe is number two but he's so inquisitive that like it ruins his life like he can't exist without constantly like he's awake all night yeah. thinking about the universe. Roger Robb asked him, were you happier in Cambridge than you were in America? And it yeah. just cuts to him lying awake at night, just wide eyed, shivering, <laughs> shaking under the covers and watching the raindrops against the window. Like that is who Oppenheimer supposedly was. Like yeah. that is apparently what he was dealing with on a daily basis. And Killian Murphy, uh, one of our finest weird little guys, right? <laughs> one thousand like, percent. Being deployed to his maximum efficiency in this movie it's nuts that we haven't really gotten killian murphy as a lead in quite some time i know like sunshine 28 days later yeah. red eye to an extent like sure. we haven't really unlocked the potential of him until this movie y'all weren't watching fucking peaky oh, yeah, there <laughs> i you guess go. that's yeah. true that's totally fair what the fuck but that dude's delivering a fucking master class I, I feel like you put anyone else in this position i don't know if this movie carries the same weight because right. as you talked about mally this movie is mostly look at killian murphy's face up close Mm -hmm. and he reads in a thousand different ways just from his baby blue eyes and just the sheer look of terror on his face at any given moment like Uh i don't know i i don't know how to express what this movie means to me i thought about it last night and i'm like we should just do like an oscars every 10 years like a second (laughs) version of the oscars and we're like let's look back at the last decade and nominate categories and this movie i feel like would sweep every fucking category like well that's how highlander won the academy award for best movie ever made (laughs) sure sure true but like i guess let's briefly talk about our history with nolan i feel like after the dark knight yeah and after inception it was easy for cinephiles and even just the general public at large it was easy to thumb your nose at nolan because you're like well that's the gimmicky guy like that's the memento guy that's the inception guy i felt like he was perceived as like this is the dumb smart guy director (sighs) and that's not a negative thing by the way i think he was also sort of he be, he quickly became shorthand right yeah. like there's very few directors who you say their last name and most of the movie going public knows who you're talking about yeah. right yeah yeah i i don't know i i feel more that way towards j 
Jonathan Nolan than I do Christopher Nolan. Sure. Because I, I feel over time, his screenplays began to value complexity over storytelling. Of like course, I have of course. four extra layers, and that makes Westworld good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely understand that. But my... I guess my point is that, like, it was easy to, like, downplay Nolan as, like, pinky out directing, right? And then, like, <laughs> sure. Tenet comes out, and everyone, like, for the most part, writes him off. I was like, this guy is just a gimmick. Uh-huh. It's like Sean Malone with his twist. Like, this guy thinks he's so fucking smart. Right. Like, I feel like that was the general perception of Tenet. Well, and, and also, there is a sort of... <laughs> weird backlash against similar to the way that you know there's that great david lynch interview where he's like you think you can watch a fucking movie on an ipad yeah (laughs) where it's like christopher nolan wants you to see his movies in theaters and there was a big backlash to that yeah part of that is also wrapped up in the covid of it all the politics of the studios like sure i mean we should acknowledge this is the first movie he's done outside of warner brothers like he left warner brothers because of the way they treated tenant yeah dumping in on hbo max like a month after his theatrical, you know, release. He saw that shit coming yeah. for miles. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of which, I bet fucking David Zaslav and his team over there, Warner Brothers, are kicking themselves in the fucking teeth after this movie makes a fucking billion dollars. They would have deleted this movie. They would have been like, it's a three hour conversation. <laughs> well, I mean, they did have a movie make a billion dollars the same time. They That's sure true, did. So. But, but if think about it, like, if they would have put both of these movies out, all of that would have been theirs. Mm-hmm. All of that would have been theirs. And maybe that bad will after like the max streaming and all that stuff, maybe that would have got swept under the rug at the time do but you like think sony made a bad decision and not waiting a couple months and trying to do madoon web <laughs> oh boy okay I'm i done. don't know if that's a cheer or a boo i don't know I'm, i don't think i get either yeah you're right. i'm just I gonna leave it away your thought no that. no no that's totally fine <laughs> legally i cannot respond to nathan on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but my point being that like nolan has consistently whether you like his movies or not knocked it out of the park both with like the intellectual quote-unquote movie goer but also the general public mm mm-hmm. And I feel like Oppenheimer was kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yes. A once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> No. You know what? No. I don't, I don't like that one. I like that. I don't like that one. Sorry, Nathan. I didn't mean to step on your toes with that's that okay. one. <laughs> I know, that's kind of that's your uh, bread and butter there. At the same time, the physical media is virtually dying. Uh-huh. This movie gets put on a Blu-ray and it is wiped off the shelves because people want to own this movie. In an age when people think physical media is dying because they only shop for it at Walmart and exactly. Best Buy. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. But I don't know. I, I think this is his magnum opus. Mm-hmm. I think this is a movie that like I'm so jealous of like thinking about 10 years from now where kids in history class are going to be watching this movie instead of like all of the I mean some of those movies were great watching like Patton and stuff in school but also we had to watch fucking Pearl Harbor somehow they've got it on VHS they roll in the cart (laughs) exactly (laughs) here's Oppenheimer on four VHS tapes I don't know man I I have so many fucking notes that I want to bring up sure this movie on this second and third rewatch it clicked so fucking hard for me as like we are so we should all be so fucking grateful to be walking in Nolan shadow like not to suck his dick too hard but like this movie <laughs> blew me away okay <laughs> also I think part of the thrill of seeing this movie for for many audiences even folks who like aren't like Nolan diehards right yeah is that Nolan much like Oppenheimer calling in all of his favors for Los Alamos boy this dude assembled the Avengers of character actors oh like every God. 30 fucking seconds is holy shit they're in this movie I'm t- tempted to say this movie has more big name stars mm-hmm. like maybe not a-listers but big name stars than like in game like yeah. I think this movie he assembled the avengers in this movie and because he he truly was like i know that there's a lot of characters yeah. so i need the audience to be able even if they don't remember the character's name i need them to say rami Mal- dude rami malik <laughs> <laughs> rami malik jump scares left and right in this movie <laughs> who knew that rami malik would get three seeds in this movie and two of them he doesn't say a fucking word yeah. And still comes through as the MVP of the movie. Like, who would have With guessed? One of his best performances, yes! I would argue. Yes. Yeah. He does so much of those two scenes where he doesn't talk. The like, man it- can't hold onto a clipboard to save his fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> it is always someone having a conversation, and then it cuts to a reverse shot, and Robbie Malik's doing that weird little smile. Like, it is, <laughs> it happens twice, and I laughed so hard both times. It's two scenes where Killian Murphy is trying to talk to, quote unquote, the grown ups. <laughs> Like shoving a clipboard into Remy Malik's chest. And I, couldn't fucking, I couldn't fucking handle it. 
<laughs> Get out of my face, Mr. Robot. <laughs> when he puts that pin back in his old pocket, I fucking <laughs> lost it, dude. But like, you're right. Like, Nolan knows. Look, there is a lot of names being tossed at you. Eltonton gets one scene and is like pivotal yes. in this fucking movie. And he knows like, I got to cast somebody that you at least recognize or cut back to them briefly so you know. Mm-hmm. And it all tracks so well. Like, I defy anyone that saw this movie only one time to fully get it. Yeah. Like, to get every connection, every thread. It took me three times and I finally was like, okay, I track every single part of this movie. I know mm-hmm. what every single character is doing, every thread that is happening here, what it, how it all connects. And again, it's beautiful what he's able to do in only three hours. Yeah, a friend of mine described this movie, especially like in the first half, as a heist movie without the heist. Yeah. Fuck. yeah. Which I, I think is so brilliant. Like, it's Assemble literally... the team. <laughs> it's Oppie's Eleven. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's paradoxical and yet it works. It's, right? It's, it, Josh Peck might as well have said the line, you son of a bitch, I'm in. Like, when he goes to recruit him. Like, it is wild what they're able to do. But I, I, again, we're jumping the gun a little bit. So let me reel it back in a little bit mm. and give you the info dump. I think you mean hopping the bomb, but yeah. <laughs> Before we Hoppenheimer, let's oh, talk about it. the info dump around Oppenheimer. Is that what I sound like? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Is that what I'm doing to people? <laughs> so again, the year is 2023. The director is, of course, Christopher Nolan. And this movie stars fucking everyone. <laughs> I, I kind of don't even want to run down the cast list, but I wrote it down to a minus fucking well. The movie stars Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Florence Pugh, Benny Safdie, Michael Angarano, Josh Hartnett, Rami Malek, Kenneth Branagh, Dane DeHaan, Dylan Arnold. David Crumholtz, Alden Ehrenreich, Matthew Modine, Gary Oldman, Alex Wolf, Casey Affleck, Jack Quaid, Emma Dumont, Matthias, I can't pronounce the guy, but the guy that plays Heisenberg, Matthias, <laughs> David Dasmalchian, Christopher Denham, Josh Peck, Tony Goldwyn, Olivia Thurlby, and James Remar. Hell yeah. Who maybe has the most devastating line of the fucking movie. He does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, yeah it made me sick to my stomach. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is a lovely city, though. It mm. is a lovely city. It is wild to me that this movie only had a budget of a hundred million dollars and managed to gross nine hundred and fifty one million dollars <laughs> worldwide that tells you it, it, so there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of days of like oh my god dune 2 looks amazing for a hundred and ninety million dollar budget I'm like yep. you guys have been brainwashed by the fact that like all of these fucking marvel movies are shooting forever because they can't make up their minds about anything yeah nolan exacts his vision but on top of that a lot of these actors are working for scale just to work with him yeah, yeah. Florence Pugh even said, like, I don't care what my fucking role is in this movie. I'll work with you. Same thing she said to Denis Villeneuve with Dune Part 2. He was, like, reportedly apologizing to her over and over, like, I'm so sorry your part is so small. She's like, I don't give a fuck. I want to do this movie. (laughs) Right. But, like, I think this is an argument between this and Dune 2. No movie should cost more than, like, $150 million. Like, there's no reason that Jurassic World 5 or whatever needs to cost $300 goddamn million. Jurassic City. There's no fucking reason. Yeah. There's no reason for it. But the movie currently has a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, oh. and at the time of this recording, it is number 85 on IMDb's top 250 movies of all time. Wow. It was nominated for 13 Oscars, including Best Achievement in Makeup and Hairstyling for Louisa Abel, Best Original Score for Ludwig Göransson, and Ooh. Jesus fucking Christ, the score. <sighs> yes. Ooh. It's incredible to me that Ludwig Göransson has gone from, like, got his start doing music for Community. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. And New Girl. Mm-hmm. And New Girl, and producing Gambino records, and now he's just <laughs> Like, I think he's one of the best composers working in Hollywood. Yeah. I might say something blasphemous here. Mm. I think his score in this movie is better than any score that Hans Zimmer has done for a Nolan movie. Ooh. Mm. Yeah. I love the Interstellar score, but this score, it might dethrone it for me as my favorite. I mean, I love the Batman Begins score, but sure. that's just very much like a hell yeah, brother kind of score. <laughs> yeah, true. As far as much hell yeah, brother as Hans Zimmer goes. There is a motif that Ludwig does in this score throughout this movie that he reprises a lot, mm-hmm. and it is simply two notes of a drowning horn oh, yeah. that chills me to the fucking bone every time it happens, mm-hmm. especially in those final 30 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. And it is fucking incredible what he's able to do. And then also very different 
type of music for him. Yeah, he totally. hasn't done a lot of classical. Yeah. yeah. There's a part in the movie that we'll talk about with his score, the can you hear the music scene oh, that yeah. is in fucking credible that we'll talk about. But anyways, mm-hmm. it's also nominated for best sound, best picture, best director, best actor for Killian Murphy, best supporting actors for Emily Blunt, best supporting actor for Robert Downey Jr., best adapted screenplay, best cinematography for the great Hoyt Von Hoytma, mm. best editing for Jennifer Lane. It is fucking wild what Jennifer Lane is able to do in this movie. Yeah. Like Much like we talked about Thelma Shoemaker with Scorsese, I don't think no one can let go of Jennifer Lane. I think he's got to keep her on. Right. I think he's found his muse. It's wild what she's able to do with this movie. But uh, best production design for Ruth DeJong and Claire Kaufman and best costume design for Ellen Mjornik. Also, uh, best bongos oh, for boy. Uh, Jack Quaid. <laughs> best yeah. by a bongos. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to mention briefly that I read up about the production done in this movie, mm. and Nolan is a fucking saint because everybody in this movie had authentic costumes. They stayed in costumes even during rehearsal. Mm-hmm. They didn't have the budget they really wanted to make Los Alamos to their fullest potential. Ruth DeJong and Claire Kaufman came in and said, Nolan, look, we're sorry. We can't really do what we need to do. And he said, don't worry about money. Disappeared for a few days, came back and said, I've tripped off 30 days of production so you guys can have your budget jesus he trimmed off 30 days of the shooting schedule wow and think about what all they have to do in this movie like yeah. all the quick cutaways there's shots of killian murphy just in a cathedral just staring up for like i don't know four seconds yeah that takes a long time to set up that's when he gets the venom symbiote <laughs> exactly yeah they had to cut that scene dear god please kill lewis Strauss. <laughs> <laughs> And then the bell tolls, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can stress enough how big of a deal cutting 30 days is. Like, 30 days. That's insane, yeah. Like, I've worked on a number of movies, mm-hmm. and cutting one fucking day I is know. always, like, the hugest, biggest fucking deal. Yeah. This man said, fuck you, 30. <laughs> They're gone. Yeah. How? I don't know. Who I, was the first AD on this? Oh, that is a great question. Let's look it up. King. Yep. Queen. I don't know. They got to be going bald right now from just pulling their hair out this whole fucking time. Yeah. Oh, no. They're dead. <laughs> they're dead. They, they look like Oppenheimer in the <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson scene. <laughs> but like, Nolan has gotten to this point in his career where he's able to, with a deft hand, change the trajectory of movie making. Like, yeah. people look to... Tenet was propped up as like, if this fails, Mm -hmm. movies have... Because there was a talk for a while, they were like, movie theaters could close. Forever. Because of COVID. Like, movie theaters could be done. Yes. Nilo Otero. Oh, okay. King. Well, he also, he's gotten like a name for himself for also being very hands-on. And like, he helps crew members like load shit in. And like, I don't know. He's very much like, from what I understand, every time I read an interview with someone who's worked with Nolan, he very much has never lost that spirit of... Of, we're gonna make a fucking movie guys yeah. isn't that great like <laughs> i had a professor in film school and mally i don't know if he was still there when you were there but he told us he was like every day if you were showing up to set and you were not just fucking thrilled just to be making a movie like yeah. his motto was "Woo, make a movie like he was a rick flair <laughs> of professors and i'm like yeah every day if you're not that excited then you've lost the, you've lost the touch you've lost the way right but like i read an interview where like robert downey jr was talking about making this movie who finally gets to do something a fucking substance and uh-huh. again he's good as Iron Man but like to see him in this spectrum is fucking nuts right. but like he said that he was sitting there with Nolan on set and Nolan handed him a piece of equipment and said can you hold this for a second I'll be right back like, <laughs> yeah. like a piece of the camera equipment yeah. and Downey was like they would never let that happen on a Marvel set and he no. goes I'm happy for it like I've never had to hold a piece of equipment on set while making a Marvel movie right. and I think Nolan understands that like the most minute detail of a movie matters he mm-hmm. doesn't have actors wear wigs. There is no CGI in this movie. It's a lot of composite shots. That, but yeah. that, but like all of the effects of like the unknown world, right. the molecules and the atoms, like that's all practical in camera. Yeah. In camera, yeah. It's fucking wild. Yeah. But like my whole point was going to be like, Benny Safdie also said that when they were filming that he would come on set Mm. and see we have eight pages of just dialogue to film today. This is going to take us two to three days. They'd be done before lunchtime. (laughs) Hoyt von Hoytema said they didn't storyboard this movie. They would just show up on set and block it and just fucking go. And it's I can't wrap my head around that. I cannot. I mean, it sounds simplistic, but it's fucking true. It's having someone who knows what What the the fuck fuck they're doing. doing. Yeah, that's it's as simple as that. Has a clear vision and has it planned out and knows what they want. Yeah. But if you think back to something like, I think the last 
great movie that's on this level is probably Fury Road. Mm. That movie was storyboarded out every fucking frame, mm-hmm. like as like a graphic novel, and it looks fucking great. And to see that this is another master at his craft. Same with Spielberg, who would just show up on set and just be like, uh, "We'll put the camera here. We'll move it over here. That's the shot." And it fucking works. People love to give James Cameron shit, but if you ever look at that guy's storyboards, they're the most fucking intricate. Like, oh my god, it's, it's shot to shot. Like mm-hmm. for, for a lot of the time. And also, like a big factor with Nolan is I fucking hate all the articles that go off about this about like, oh, Nolan doesn't allow chairs on set. Bullshit. Mm. So what he's talking about is like the fucking producer villages right. and all of the fucking like director's chairs, yep. like all of that shit that they set up behind the camera that, yeah, is fucking pointless. Like, right. I'm about to talk shit on a certain <laughs> fucking film department, but like go. the hair and makeup department, they always need their little fucking chair sure. and all that shit. He doesn't allow that because if you're shooting, you know, left mm-hmm. and all of that shit is to the right, but then you have to turn the camera around. Yeah, right. it's convenient. You now have to move all that shit, yeah, which exactly. takes fucking time. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, he doesn't allow that shit on set. I just don't want it right there. Yeah. He wants to run and gun. Yeah. He wants to keep moving. He doesn't want anything to delay. He shoots like an indie film, exactly. even though it's a $100 million budget. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, yeah, bitch, like, grab a fucking Apple box exactly. if you want a chair. It's fine. But people are taking that as though he is like this dictator yeah. who is like, no one can ever rest yeah no like i don't know yes. yeah and that's not what it is at all no. he's yeah. just like I, we don't need all that extra shit he's right. not hitchcock he's not kubrick <laughs> he's not berating his fucking cast yeah to get the performance out of them he's letting the comfortability speak for itself sure if he wants to turn the camera like five feet to the left mm-hmm. he doesn't want to have to move a fucking crowd of fucking chairs it's right. the same why he doesn't have a video village yeah he's like i don't know just watch it you don't need to fucking i know what i just filmed yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> i'm good he has his little monitor and he's good yeah, yeah that back room where they film the beratement of oppenheimer mm-hmm. is a practical room they yeah. are no flyaway walls they are crammed in there mm-hmm. they said that like occasionally the cast and crew that were off camera would just have to sit on the floor right. because like we have to position the camera here but we need you guys like the you know the second ac or whatever we need you right here you're just gonna sit on the floor like that is what nolan is doing you're right it is like an indie film production yeah like we are running and gunning we're trying to make budget we're trying to make it on time and i don't need the little inconsistency of video villages two feet to the left mm-hmm. i want every possible frame i can get every possible inch of the frame filled with something if i can do it and it, it fucking pays off which is not to say that that's how everyone should work sure. but it works for him and he hasn't really fucked up yet no <laughs> even nolan's weaker films are still fucking slam dunks compared to his contemporaries like they're at least interesting right exactly, like, I, I'm, exactly. I'm not wild about tenet yeah. granted i have only seen it the one time yeah so maybe that's on me i'm in the same boat i feel like i do need to go back and give it a, another rewatch but mm-hmm. I'm also thinking like it's sandwiched in between Dunkirk and this and like Dunkirk is like this incredibly prestigious like thought provoking self reflecting kind of movie and right. I feel like this is too mm-hmm. whereas Tenet he's like alright I'll give you your, your next inception whatever sure you know I made a movie I wanted to make I'm gonna make this Nolan movie for you guys yeah. right. I'm gonna go make another movie for myself exactly here's James Bond moving backwards yeah, yeah exactly he's like <laughs> if I can ever get my James Bond movie I'll make it my fucking way surprise motherfuckers it's a moment Memento movie. Right. <laughs> but again, like, even with that movie, he was like, why don't they just learn how to fight backwards? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, say what you will about Tenet, especially the story, but, like, as far as, like, the production quality, like, it's fucking crazy. It's uh, wild. It's a technical achievement, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Even when Nolan maybe is too up his own ass about, like, the story and about the character motivations, because mm-hmm. I think John David Washington is a fucking bore in that movie, I but do too. Yeah. he makes that movie look like a billion dollars. Like, it looks fucking incredible. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, this movie had to invent new film stock just to be filmed like they didn't IMAX didn't have a black and white film stock right they made it for this movie like again he is changing the trajectory of things and it's only because no one ever asked no right. one ever needed black and white film stock and we need it to look of the same quality yeah. as the color footage yeah. like it's like all of those considerations are just incredible to me it's yeah. nuts because he didn't say like oh I'm Zack Snyder I filmed a four hour movie and now I'm going to turn on the black and white filter I know 
no, God. Yeah, the black and white versions of movies that were not filmed in black and white, not prepared for black and white. It's just, it's a novelty. It's yeah. not fucking worth it. Fury Road's the only one that works. And yeah. it's because they, they went through and like painstakingly corrected it. Yeah. yeah. The black and white version of Logan did not work. Nope. Right. Like, oh, you want to see out the window? Too bad. It's fucking blown out now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a friend of mine was in uh, a movie from The Asylum. Oh, boy. And they did this weird thing where there was a special black and white edition on the Blu-ray of the movie he was in. Oh, boy. And they literally just, like, switched it over in whatever editing s- software they had. Ugh. And it looks like shit. I bet. I bet. All right, boys. We're pretty deep into this episode. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and revisit the trailer okay. one last time before discussing the movie. No. <laughs> Oh, you didn't pull the original teaser, I see. Mm-mm. <laughs> Full on trailer. Mm. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Dig, if you will, a picture. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about that teaser, too. I got some inside scoops. They won't fear it. Yeah. Until they understand it. Fuck yeah. Fucking love marbles. <laughs> and they won't understand it. So many scenes where he stares at the warhead and it's just talking to him like the Green Goblin mask. <laughs> <laughs> Would be crazy. It was like, eh. <laughs> Bomb their heart. <laughs> oh, boy. Ooh, there's a fun edit in there somewhere. God, this fucking score. Ever going to tell the truth about what's happening here? I know we usually talk over these trailers, but I'm just so fucking engrossed. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see Josh Peck, I think about when someone commented on my old band's music video asking when Josh Peck started a band. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Peck, again, Nolan, I don't think has the ego that a lot of directors have. Like mm. casting Josh Peck, he probably doesn't know who the fuck Josh Peck is. He's just like, hey, man, I think he will fit for this fucking role. Uh-huh. And he has maybe two, three lines of dialogue. But he gets to press the fucking button. Yeah. Dude, oh my God. When he's like, up at Homer's explaining to him, when this, if this drops below one volt, you push that button yeah you see the fear in his eyes that Uh Oppie has later on in the movie like josh peck embodies something in this movie in the i don't know 40 seconds of screen time he gets like i also think that to be fair a later season episode of drake and josh probably would have had them accidentally create (laughs) like an (laughs) h-bomb i would have appreciated that (laughs) and this thing is like you could pick almost any side character from this movie Uh and it's like their life would probably make a fucking decent film yes yeah Yeah. oh i i would watch a gene tatlock movie i was just thinking about gene tatlock yeah 100 percent Oh, man. Again, I, I'm worried about actually talking about the movie itself because, I've again, I've taken the most notes I've ever taken. And no, let's fucking get into it. Yeah. But you just want to just run through the plot? Yeah. yeah, I guess we can start with the plot. So this movie, the way it's structured is we are jumping back and forth in time. Mm-hmm. In a Nolan movie? I know. Could you imagine? <laughs> but like, we're talking about the lead up to the creation of the atomic bomb, mm. the dropping of the bomb, and then the aftermath of how that impacted not only the world, but Oppenheimer himself Mm -hmm. at the same time we are using the narrative device of a character known as lewis strauss who is up for a cabinet position Mm -hmm. for i think it's hoover right yeah Yeah. for director of commerce yeah and he is being interviewed by this committee and they want to know about the oppenheimer incident Mm -hmm. so that is the way we're telling this movie through two different lenses through two different perspectives and it's fucking genius because yes this could be a bare bones from start to finish plot and it would still be a great movie Mm -hmm. but seeing how oppenheimer was berated 
and chastise and cast out later on in his life. Mm -hmm. It is good to put a singular perspective on that Mm -hmm. through the eyes of Louis Strauss because he's such a vindictive piece of shit (laughs) that you can't help but kind of root for Oppenheimer, even given the absolute war crimes and just the crimes against humanity that he's committed. Right. And it's genius because the only character in this movie that is created whole cloth out of thin air is Alden Ehrenreich's character. Yeah. Every other character in this movie is a real person. This is, I think, the unsung performance from this movie. Like, true, I feel like true, nobody right? is talking about how fucking great he is. Dude is underrated as fuck. Yeah. Incredible. And he's great in Solo. I, I don't agree. care what anyone fucking says. He's great in that movie. Also, apparently, a very nice guy. He That's seems what like I've he heard. Be. Yeah. When that article of Times gets put in his hand <laughs> and Louis Strauss reveals that he has the inside scoop on the Times article and that he has been friends with, you know, the creator of Time magazine. And he's the one that gave board in the file. Like uh-huh. you see that man slumped down in the chair and just filled with anger and resentment and like just feeling dumb. He's grossed out. Yeah, exactly. He feels dumb that he got played and he's just a Senate aide. Like he yeah. doesn't have really any stake in this game. But you can also feel how <laughs> he, I mean, we're jumping way the fuck ahead. Sure, but sure. When he has that line about maybe they were talking about something more important than you. Oh <laughs> my God. That's the biggest bomb drop of the movie. It really <laughs> is. It truly is. He puts that man in his fucking place and you see down and he like scoff like, now you got me there. Like, <laughs> And then he opens the door and that camera flash catches Robert Downey off guard. Like yeah. it makes him snap back to reality a bit. Like forces that smile. Ugh. It's it's such a measured performance from both of them. God damn it. All right, let's, let's jump back to the beginning. Yes. So in order to talk about this movie properly, I, I do want to talk about just my experience on this rewatch because just to be incredibly vulnerable here, this rewatch was horrific for me. Mm. Not that the movie is bad because it's far from it. Rain out of lotion. It, <laughs> it hit me way harder than the first watch because I found myself choking back something the entire time. And Don't I, say anything, Mally. Don't say anything. I know. Mally. I Don't know. Say anything, I Mally. knew it was going to happen, but I think it's a combination of Nolan's direction, it's Ludwig's score, Killian's traumatized performance, Yeah, and I couldn't help but think about how even though the events of this movie took place almost a fucking century ago, that the threat of nuclear war is still, maybe more than ever, prevalent yep. today. Yep. And I was reading today about just how many nukes there are in the world, and to know that combined, Russia and America have about 7,000 nukes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that are 80 times more powerful than the ones that were set off at the Trinity test and in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And I watched the movie ISS this weekend, oh, which yeah. is this fine little movie, but it depicts these Russian and American astronauts up on the ISS when nuclear war breaks out between the two countries. Yeah. And there's a shot in that movie where one of the astronauts looks down to Earth and it is just vibrantly orange and ash. Yeah. And it mimics the ending shot of this movie where Nolan imagines that that image of the globe and just this sweeping <sighs> chain reaction of the atmosphere igniting. Yeah. And I, I couldn't help but fucking tear up the whole fucking movie. Like, yeah, I couldn't fucking do it. And you put it correct. I mean, there's a shell shock to Murphy's performance in this movie because he, you know, Oppenheimer the whole time keeps kind of telling himself. I mean, he's telling himself a lie, right? Yeah. That like, as soon as we use one of them, we show them what it can do. No one would ever want to build another one of these. Yep. Like he's and he's lying to himself he knows in the back of his mind that that's not where it stops yeah and then he has to sort of step back and reckon with what he's done while everyone has been telling him the whole time hey man maybe this is a terrible idea (laughs) that is the greatest argument for not showing the hiroshima and nagasaki after effect Mm -hmm. like when they show that slideshow of the images Mm -hmm. that you don't see and he can't even fucking look at them it's damning of him as well sure it is it's one it's you know we we are following him so he didn't see it so we don't see it yeah but also that is also the movie being like the worst world isn't letting him off the hook yeah you know i think if we really want to put a label on it he probably is and the movie is telling you as much the most important person that's ever lived Mm -hmm. i find it hard to make an argument against it because especially if everything ends because of him exactly like yes he's telling himself a lie that like if we demonstrate this power of this weapon Mm -hmm. and you know matt damon's character emphasizes that would we intend to do it in the most unambiguous way possible twice jesus You would like to think that people would see that and go, we've got to fucking stop what the fuck we're doing. Mm -hmm. But 
again, this is probably why I was so fucking choked up the whole movie is thinking like, we thought the same fucking thing in 2016 when Trump was elected. Uh-huh. Everyone's like, well, no, he's clearly not going to get elected. And that's he crazy. Does, and we're like, well, he won't get a reelection. And now it's fucking coming down to that. There's <laughs> a very real possibility it's going to happen. We and, saw January 6th and we were like, oh, it's done. Yeah, he's yeah. done, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it never happened. And Project 2025 is right around the fucking corner too. Christ. And I don't know. I've grown so fucking cold and angry. And Same. putting on a three hour movie that not only shows just the human condition, but the repercussions of resorting to the complicity uh-huh. of reckless nuclear wisdom, much like we talked with Shin Godzilla, uh-huh. it fucking wrecked me, dude. I, it's. Again, this is the most important movie, I think, of maybe the 2020s, maybe the 20th century in general, the 21st century. (laughs) I mean, if there's a takeaway from this movie, it's that we're never going to do the right thing. (laughs) That's why you're right. It is the ultimate Silver Linings movie of like, this is bleaker than you could possibly imagine Mm -hmm. because it has real world implications. Yeah. All the way back in season one, we talked about Terminator 3 and the ending of that movie. Almost as good as this film, of course. (laughs) Almost as good. Almost as good. But like... Jonathan Mostow. Christopher Nolan. It's still a real threat that is apparent. Yeah. And it's something you have to... I'm forced to think about it every fucking day Mm -hmm. and I can't... I can't deal it. I can't do it. It's Damon that has the line about letting the genie out of the bottle, right? Yeah. Like, it is, that's that's the perfect metaphor for it. You can't go back. And I think, I listened to the Blank Check episode about this movie, and mm. I think David and Griffin Newman had a very good point about, like, that's kind of what Tenet is about, in a way, of, like, you can't undo an invention. You right. can't uncreate something and release it on the world. That's kind of a reason why I want to rewatch Tenet, because I almost feel like after this movie, it might feel therapeutic to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it might be because that movie is all about undoing things that are inevitable almost right. like it is interesting that Nolan is so obsessed with time mm-hmm. and like the creation of things and also the destruction of things because it seems to be a running theme throughout his movies but time like, and what if scientists were jocks yep yeah <laughs> and if they fucked a lot like they fucking <laughs> Oppie is a fucking slut like I, I don't know how else to describe it this man was laying pipe I'm sure there's plenty of different ways to describe it <laughs> he pulls and Dustin he pulls he sure fucking does the late game reveal that he's been he's been fucking this other the Ruth reveal yes. oh my god yes. I was like what I, I didn't catch that the first time around no I me neither man when he was like well there's no way Richard could have died a broken heart beat he didn't even find out about it oh my god so cold <laughs> which my biggest thing with that wasn't like it was just bro where where did you find the time like yeah. <laughs> i barely find time like i'm just a fucking film accountant and i barely have fucking time to do this goddamn fucking podcast <laughs> when damon's like 80 babies were bored last year at los alamos uh-huh. now we're having 10 a month and i'm like What's the percentage of those are oppies? Like, <laughs> let's just be real if we're really going to get into it. God. <laughs> Dustin. Mm-hmm. He pulls. He pulls, man. <laughs> he pulls. Uh, anyway, okay, let's let's kind of break this movie apart from the beginning because it does start fairly formulaic in terms of how a biopic starts. Mm-hmm. We cut to the ending and then we cut back to see how we got there. So Roger Robb, who is kind of leading this charge against what is essentially just a routine security clearance hearing, right? Mm-hmm. Dude, and that fucking actor what's his name jason clark yeah he keeps tricking me because like one movie he's really good and then the next movie he's absolute dog shit i I can't figure out i can't fucking get this dude down he's great in this but i i totally agree but i've also seen terminator i was gonna say (laughs) terminator not good but so he's basically just up for a routine security clearance. Mm-hmm. Now, I feel like if you're not clued into this movie and you're not tuned into what it's doing, this seems like, well, who gives a shit? It's just a security clearance. Right. He's not really involved with the creation or the physics of hands-on creating things for the AEC or whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that because he is the father of the atomic bomb. Right. And much like he says directly, he is the voice of his time, much like Albert Einstein was a generation before. Mm-hmm. And to not have have his input on what the U.S. is doing in terms of their nuclear programs, especially with the development of the supers, Yeah, it discredits him entirely. And the whole point of this is it's a facade, right? That, spoiler right. alert, Strauss orchestrated mm-hmm. as a act of vengeance and vindictiveness mm-hmm. to basically discredit Oppie and label him as a Russian asset because now we're in the Cold War that he fucking predicted and was warning people about. Right. And it ruins this man because he's already dealing with the guilt of knowing he unlocked something that is 
forever unlockable. Mm -hmm. Like, you cannot undo the fact that we have created atomic weapons that then lead to thermonuclear weapons. And he's already, at this point, endured decades of guilt. Yeah. Like, this man looks disheveled. His hair is great. He's not even 60 yet. And he looks like he's on death's door. He weighs like 65 pounds. It's insane. Well, and he's got this thousand yard stare, like, because he knows he's being fucked over. Yeah. And he's just going through the motions of these hearings, right? Yeah. Like, they could not be more obvious about the fact that they are manipulating this. They have, they all have letters that Oppenheimer's not been allowed to read that then they question him about secret recordings secret recordings <laughs> from 12 years ago mm-hmm. there's the bit where i think it's dane dehan who's reading oh no it's it's uh das Malchian who's reading that letter yep and every sentence begins with some version of more probably than not yeah. like he's just yep. like they're fucking him based on assumptions they've made it's like i don't know but fucking maybe yeah, yeah. exactly he's like eh, probably I mean, there's like a 1% chance it didn't happen, but you know, probably. And one of the biggest gut punches in the movie is when Oppenheimer says, is anyone ever going to tell the truth about what happened here? And he might as well be asking Christopher Nolan, can you bail me out? That is a blinking sign. Like Nolan is is telling you, hey, this is the line of the movie. This is the tagline (laughs) of anything else. And, you know, at this point, the whole reason he doesn't fight because Kitty, his wife, the whole time is like, you have got to fight. Mm -hmm. This is a fucking charade why do you let them do this to you and in his mind he's like look i have i am responsible for potentially the end of fucking humanity right it is my creation my leading the charge that may very well especially that last time in the movie that he sums it up perfectly mm-hmm. we may all be fucking over because of me yeah i might as well be tarred and feathered and fucking put under the guillotine because that's what i deserve and what strauss doesn't understand is that he's not playing a martyr He truly believes he should be punished. Strauss can't fathom a world where, like, you own up to your mistakes. (laughs) Sure. You know? He doesn't comprehend that because he doesn't have a fucking soul, or at least that's how he's portrayed in this movie. Who's Mm -hmm. to say about the real guy? But, like, I wish there was one moment where Kitty, of all people, would be like, I get it. Mm -hmm. But she can't. And I think maybe the only person that does get it besides Oppie is maybe Crummelt. Yeah. Maybe. And maybe even Aaron Reich to an extent, but like, I guess that's a question worth asking is like, what is an apt punishment for someone like Oppenheimer? Mm. What do you do with somebody like that? Because <sighs> I think just exile, right? I mean, that's what we did to fucking Napoleon. We just <laughs> fucking exiled him to an island. And I think that inevitably happened one way or another with Oppenheimer. So I think where this movie ends up at is that he's in his own personal hell, yeah. right? Like yeah. he is being punished because he can't, he's having these like psychological psychotic episodes and these moments where he's leaving reality completely and look uh, the movie makes no bones about it not a great guy no like (laughs) a guy a guy who the math and followed the theory and ended up building a machine that could kill everyone and i think nolan is making the best decision he can make with filming those scenes from strauss's point of view in black and white and telling you this is the objective truth like (laughs) i mean literally this guy is putting it in black and white white for us yes like, <laughs> yeah yeah and like he's coming in especially when he meets with strauss about the potential job at the institute yeah and coming in swinging dick and being <laughs> like you know strauss goes i'm a self-made man and op goes oh i can relate my dad was one <laughs> and like he talks about him like i could take this fucking job but i don't know if i really want to and yeah. he's, he's like you know why didn't you ever get into physics strauss and he goes well i studied mit and then i decided to just become a shoe salesman and he comes at him with the line of oh lewis strauss a lowly shoe salesman mm-hmm. and Robert Downey fires back with no just a shoe salesman like that is I feel like especially because this is after the Trinity test and after the bomb was dropped yeah that maybe that's what Oppie really felt like and was basking in the glory because Strauss <laughs> even says like he took on the mantle of like yes I am the father of the atomic bomb mm-hmm. you know what I mean and I wrestled with that idea of like no one says this is the objective truth but I feel like a better answer would be this is Strauss's perspective of it mm. you know what I mean I I think in yeah. some ways, I mean, I, I think we, we are seeing what actually happened. Sure. But I think part of illuminating what actually happened for us is to tell us what Strauss's perspective is, right? Yeah, because like when we talk about that isotope hearing. Yeah. And how he clowned him there. Right. You could see Strauss's perspective in the black and white because that's what we see the whole movie until the very end is that black and white perspective. 
perspective. Yes. And he kind of chuckles along too with like, damn, he got me. Yeah. But then when you see it in color, he is not fucking into the idea of being ridiculed in front of this public display. You know what I mean? Sure. Well, I think it also, it, the, that difference there shows you Oppenheimer had a bit of a persecution complex as well. Like, yeah. this is a guy who is actively, you know, fucking up his own personal relationships and then just sort of has a response of like, well, why can't everybody just be chill about yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think that the black and white versus the colored stuff, especially in that scene at the lake with Albert. Yes. That's where it really came down to me of like, if you think about it from the movie, because we've seen that scene about three different times. Mm -hmm. The first time is in black and white from Strauss's perspective. And, you know, again, Oppie's got this fucking ego in this moment. Mm -hmm. But when we see it in color and you see that last line of the movie where, again, the weight of the fucking universe and history itself is in fucking Killian's performance. Yeah. I can't imagine that he then comes back with <laughs> you know i'll think about this fucking job you know right. I, I can't imagine and of course no who's to say because that actual discussion never fucking happened he right. never really met with einstein on that level right especially with that equation he brings him later on he was with a different scientist but like I don't know. I, I think both can be true and also neither can be true at the same time, if that makes any sense. Yeah. You're talking about the scene where what I've done by Lincoln Park yep. starts playing yep. at, the, at the very end. <laughs> Incredible way to end the movie. Really bold, but it pays <laughs> off. Okay. So let's jump back a bit because mm. the movie starts. And again, the first frame of the movie is telling you what the end of the movie is going to be. And you just don't even know it yet, which is fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. But these raindrops that are pouring into this puddle. Raindrops keep falling. Oh <laughs> young Killian Murphy just staring at them in horror. Mm-hmm. And and this is how we start. I mean, this man is already traumatized just by the burden of knowledge that he has. Yes. He's studying at Cambridge. He can't fucking do things in the lab. He's more of a theory guy. Mm-hmm. And you really get a feel for him at the beginning. And mm-hmm. like, I, I, like, I relate to Oppie at the beginning of this movie because I also fucking suck at algebra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like, he's, you know, wants to go see Niels Bohr give this presentation who's played by Kenneth Branagh beautifully, yeah. I might add. But it's weird seeing him do this voice without a mustache. I know, especially coming <laughs> off a of Tenet too with that fucking performance. <laughs> he's given <laughs> yeah jesus what if he did have the mustache in this though <laughs> i wish i fucking wish he is held back by his professor who can't go to the lecture so he decides to poison this apple that the teacher has yes. and this is the only part of the movie that the grandson of oppenheimer said he didn't like about the movie he's like yeah. there's no proof that ever happened it's been speculated yeah but- there's a bit of contention there because yeah. like oppenheimer sort of debated the story and then even the autobi or the biography american Prom- Prometheus was like, maybe it happened. Mm-hmm. And then Nolan's movie presents it as hell yeah, it did. Mm-hmm. I will say that's the one thing in the movie where I'm like, I don't really need that. Well, sure. I think it's perfect because, again, the colored stuff is all subjective, right? If that's right. what Nolan is telling us, you can play that up to maybe this happened, maybe it didn't. But I also think it's important to set up right away that Oppenheimer is not a good guy. He's also not without his vindictive moments. Yeah. Exactly. He is a flawed character if there ever was one. Like, as much as by the end of this movie, mm, I, th- I don't know. He's the protagonist so i think that means <laughs> nolan agrees with him completely Absolutely, nolan has put his foot down and said everything he does in this movie i agree with every little thing he does is magic mm-hmm. <laughs> are you paying attention <laughs> little prestige joke there yeah so he goes oh, to no, see we got it we got it okay so he goes to see niels bohr he asks him this question and Neil Bors comes back to him and is like, how are you at this school? And he's like, and his professor chimes in and he goes, he sucks in the fucking lab. This kid can't do shit with a fucking beaker. And he's like, he's more of a theory guy. Mm. And so he tells him you need to go study under uh, Born mm-hmm. and this German, I believe. I believe it's German. Or maybe it's Switzerland. I can't remember. He goes study somewhere else. You, you're not fit for this place. Mm-hmm. And man, he says to young Oppie, he's like, algebra is like sheet music. The important thing isn't can you read music? It's can you hear it? Can you hear the music, Robert? Oh, Ooh. my fucking God. Yes, one of the best lines. Oh. And that is when we get that insane bit of score yes. that sort of finally resolves itself. Uh-huh. I have some tidbit about this. Yeah, so do you? Ludwig was going to do this whole score, this whole piece right here, this Can You Hear the Music, that is about a hundred and something seconds long, not very long, mm-hmm. but it has 30-something tempo changes within itself. Mm. And was like talking to his wife, who I believe is a, uh, a violinist, and was like, look, I think what we're going to do is we're going to record this thing in pieces and kind of stitch it together and she's like no just fucking have your musicians film it you know in one take they're fucking musicians they're professionals Mm -hmm. and this 
this piece, it's so simple because it's just a montage of fucking Killian Murphy going to another school, looking at paintings, experiencing what's in his head. Reading the wasteland. Yeah. Clearly not playing a single game of beer pong while he was at school. Throwing glasses <laughs> against the wall just to see how they shatter. We've yeah. all been there. Sure. This 90 seconds is some of the most beautiful fucking imagery I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And this score, again, it just kicks off with that can you hear the music? And it's, I broke down crying like right there. Yeah, no, and, and you can see everything sort of finally crystallized for him. Yeah. He's like, I know I have a purpose. These abstract images that we're seeing, they mm-hmm. finally start to unite into like actual shapes. I, I, yeah, it's great. I feel like if you have a person who is like, I want to get into the arts, especially when it comes to filmmaking, mm-hmm. I just, I need that last little bit of inspiration. If you show them this montage and it doesn't click for them, I don't know what to tell you. Like, mm-hmm. this was the reason I got into filmmaking was stuff like this, like how you can convey so much emotion, so much time time passing Mm -hmm. so much of a character experiencing things and growing in the moment in only 90 fucking seconds like this is like the best scene damn near i think he's ever done Mm -hmm. that's dialogue free for the most part it's fucking wild yeah so he goes to the school he he goes and you know takes a lecture from heisenberg and he meets david krumholtz Mm -hmm. who is the only other american that he knows he gives a speech in dutch that he only learned six weeks out he learned an entire fucking language which is true yeah (laughs) fun fact about the scene where he speaks uh drunk german aka dutch Uh (laughs) so i saw this with my wife go Go ahead, Nathan. My wife. <laughs> His, His wife. wife. <laughs> His wife in Berg. Yeah. She, <laughs> nice. She is German and gets very particular when people in movies speak German. Oh, and the sure. is like, oh my God, they can't fucking do it right. Why? Like, why is this in German if they can't say it right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this scene starts... And she's just like, oh, my fucking God. Like, that's the worst German I ever fucking... Oh, it's Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it took her a second, but she just, like... I could hear her muttering, like, angrily under her breath. Uh-huh. And then it just clicked, and she's like, oh, 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 it's Dutch. Okay, that's why it sounds stupid. <laughs> and I love David Krubboltz's, like, coming in me like, I'll help you translate his English. Don't worry about it. And then he immediately starts to Oh, he, com- he comes in there so <laughs> cocky and immediately is like, wait, what's this? What the fuck is happening? They lampshade it with the whole, like, you learn Dutch in six weeks, but you never learn Yiddish, which yeah. is like, <laughs> such a great joke. <laughs> There's not a line in this movie that's wasted. Every line fucking sings. Dave Krumholtz Incredible. fucking demolishes in this movie. Yeah. Yes, he fucking does. In a movie that is stacked with performances that are Oscar worthy, right. this man should be in the equation as well. Like he's only in a handful of scenes, but every scene he's in fucking is incredible. Yeah. Especially in that scene in Los Alamos where he says that he's not coming. Oh, oh my god! He starts crying and then he sucks it up. Basically, yeah. I honestly like. I think this is the best supporting performance in the film. But Oof. like, that's also death by a thousand cuts right. because <laughs> everyone in this movie is great. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you know, we talked about it under the cherry boot. I want. A bro that'll just fill my bathtub with roses i want one that'll just give me a peeled orange every once in a while you know what i mean (laughs) absolutely speaking of performances tom conti as fucking einstein oh man that man was born to play einstein yeah over 80 years old and still fucking crushing it because he is so fucking charming he is so likable and they managed to age him up like when he first goes and sees him and james urbaniak is walking him through the woods yes yeah he has a different oeuvre about him Mm. versus when he goes and sees him by the side of the lake he's always so good i don't know man every performance is so good i agree (laughs) And speaking of performances, what a reintroduction to Josh Hartnett. This man chiseled out a fucking marble. I've never seen someone grow into their look as much as him. What a fucking... And not to say he was ever bad looking, but... I did not realize how much I missed him until he showed up in this movie. Yeah, He is so warm and so inviting even when he's yelling at Oppie I fucking love it I was a huge fan of his performance in Penny Dreadful Mm. and like then he just kind of what he's done a couple of uh, Guy Ritchie movies and then some like some smaller flicks right and then but like this this was like Ashley's a huge Josh Hartnett fan Mm -hmm. and she literally was just like he's like a guy now yeah I don't know how else to describe it like he's He's like a man's man yeah (laughs) 
And I guess this is also kind of full spectrum, right? Because Mm -hmm. for those who don't know, he turned down playing Batman in Batman Begins. That's right. And this is kind of like coming full circle. Like he's like, now I'll star in your biggest fucking movie of all time. Yeah. And fucking sings in this movie. Wait, I thought it was he auditioned for Joker. No, he was supposed to be Batman. Uh, He auditioned for Batman. Killian Murphy did like a costume test as Batman. Killian Murphy was one of the top three. Yeah, 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 that's true. Which can you fucking imagine? Oh my God. (laughs) But like this fucking hairdo he's got, these glasses, yeah. he's fucking towering over Killian Murphy, but also is just so fucking warm and inviting. Mm-hmm. And I don't, what a fucking reintroduction to this guy. I fucking love him. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's like big science jock energy in this movie. Yeah. You, know, you get it from him. You get it from uh, Matt Damon. This man should have been a linebacker, not right. be this fucking scientist. You know what I mean? But um, he did a movie recently that I worked on. I can't remember what it was called, but basically it was, uh, oh, Exterminate All the Brutes. Oh, so this yeah. was a mini uh-huh. series and he was basically playing the dramatization of this story that they were telling i don't think he even had any lines of dialogue but he, oh, he's wow. fucking great in that as well he is credited as white man yeah which seems accurate and oh i was going to talk about this because we we talked about why didn't i pull the teaser instead of the trailer but i did briefly work on a teaser for this movie it oh, ultimately right. didn't go mm-hmm. but it was crazy like just working on this movie before it came out and like all we got all we got was him suiting up in that, you know, suit and pipe like he's fucking Batman. Like, it's, <laughs> and that's all we got. We had to make a teaser out of that and like the visuals of the bomb and everything. And it was so fucking exciting to work on. But you know, I have terrible asthma, but one of my takeaways from this movie was I need a fucking pipe. I, I just start smoking. Start carrying a pipe around. <laughs> yeah. I gotta start smoking. <laughs> No one has ever looked as cool, man. Like, I don't know. One of my fucking takeaways is that we cannot fucking escape Dylan fucking Arnold. I know, right? (laughs) I know. Jesus. Motherfucker just keeps popping up. The fact that Cameron and the podcaster from David Gordon Green's Halloween are both in this movie. That's right. And are so, so wildly different in their performances. Like, fucking Chevalier is one of the greatest characters in the movie. When I realized that was Cameron could not believe it. Oh, like, I know. I, it blew me away. Yeah. I know. He's fucking great. When he's he comes great. back and they're setting up the Trinity test, yeah. like, he's... That's the interesting thing. Like, you have all these powerhouse actors. Robert Downey Jr., Killian Murphy, Emily Blunt, and then, like, when Killian Murphy is talking to Josh Peck, you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, when he's talking to Cameron from fucking Halloween, you're yeah. like, this is the movie? Like, this is incredible. Yeah. It's fucking wild. The mayor from Buffy's in this. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> the <laughs> smallest <laughs> scenes like throwaway performances are the biggest thing there's a scars guard in this movie yeah. like it's it's wild well that's always been one of nolan's like big things right like yeah. he always brings back someone we've sort of forgotten about or mm-hmm. like hollywood's moved on from I, and i, I just I, I love that like he he gives people opportunities he's doing the tarantino thing yeah, yeah totally yeah. or he does a thing where like i'll hire somebody to play this role that you would not expect or somebody that it doesn't matter if they have the acting prowess Right. I know I can lead them. Like when he had fucking Harry Styles and Dunkirk. Yeah, totally. Who could have foreseen that fucking comment? Which gave that man way too much unwanted confidence. <laughs> way too much. <laughs> way too much. It's like Dr. Strange love or how I learned to not give Harry Styles the fucking confidence. <laughs> That's what this movie should, tagline should have been. But anyway, so he goes to this communist party and he meets Florence Pugh. Mm-hmm. Jesus, we are an hour and 15 minutes in this episode and we're only to this point of the movie. Yeah. I know, I'm sorry. But like, I love how like, Nolan has always been chastised of like, he refuses to show blood. He refuses to show like genuine emotion and characters. Mm-hmm. And the one thing is like, Nolan's never had a sex scene in his movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, we fucking in this one. <laughs> I love that he responds to that with the least fanfare you could have for a sex scene. Like it just <laughs> cuts to them, boring sex. Oh, like. They are reading during it. She, that's how fucking nerdy this is. <laughs> These people are insufferable. insufferable. Like, I was thinking about every fucking lit major. And <laughs> if I'm being honest, most of my fellow theater students that I knew uh-huh. in college. Uh-huh. Like, it's so funny to think like this movie is filled with basically nerds. Right. And like, no one's like, <laughs> yeah. what would it be like if nerds were, you know, getting down and heavy? We'd be reading Sanskrit yeah, to each other. Sanskrit. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And I love, too, that, like, if you're familiar with Oppenheimer to any extent, you know the classic phrase, right? Uh-huh. Now I have become death destroyer of worlds. Yeah. And this is where he puts it. Like, it is so it's fucking- It's his me want cookie. It's so fucking funny. He's like, I'll have him say it as Florence Pugh is mounting him. It is so fucking funny. It is. Like, the first time I watched this, it was truly a, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. Like, it's almost pathetic. <laughs> like, I have to have him read Sanskrit to get off. Like, <laughs> It also makes you think, though, like, if this is his objective viewpoint, or his subjective viewpoint, rather, then, like, this is what was memorable to him, was the intellectual exchange more so than the physical one. Yeah, exactly. And, like, Killian Murphy, like, just simply him thinking. Yeah. I could watch an hour of it, because, like, when Alex Wolf comes in, he's like, hey, guys, they split the atom. Yeah. He immediately, you see him, like, processing, okay, what does this mean? And he says it. He's like, you know, I'm thinking what everyone else in the world is thinking, or every ever physicist, this can be turned into a bomb. Mm-hmm. And I love that you hear Josh Hartnett, off, like, off screen go, like, well, theory will only take you so far, right? Mm. It is amazing that this movie moves at such a fast fucking pace. Mm-hmm. Like, I know this podcast isn't, but, like, it's incredible <laughs> what no one's able to do with this amount of time. And then, I'm no Christopher Nolan, no, I'll be honest. you're not. You're really fucking not. <laughs> <laughs> Then this is where we find out that Emily Blunt's been lurking in the background this whole movie, and man... Dude, she literally steps out of the shadows in one scene, like... (laughs) (laughs) Like, no one has got this reputation of he can't write female characters, Mm -hmm. and I think this is a step up. Mm. It's not still fully there yet, but like, you gotta tell him this is like the one movie where he doesn't have a dead wife. Sure. Damn, true. He has a dead ex-girlfriend, but... Again, the one thing <laughs> in the favor of this performance is that if this is how Oppenheimer viewed her, then okay. And also, she did have some fucking demons. Boy. Kitty had some yeah. demons in real life. Every fucking line of dialogue has some connection to her drinking. Like, when they fucking... <laughs> she says at one point, okay, the brat is put down finally. Where's the martini? She's like Anna Gasteyer <laughs> And reefer madness. Like, this is like, a, it is truly like an SNL performance in some bits. Her first note about seeing Los Alamos for the first time is like, where's the saloon? Right. <laughs> It's fucking wild. But also, her first scene is essentially like, she's drunk, and she's like, tell me about quantum mechanics, daddy. Yeah, yeah. I'm already wet. Let's just keep it going. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, how the fuck did this guy pull? But like, she has this incredible pathos to her, because mm-hmm. like, when they go out to the desert, she has got the realist fucking vision that Oppenheimer, I think, eventually adopts. Mm-hmm. But when she's talking about her past marriages, and she's like, you know, I had a husband who went and fought in the Spanish Civil War. Mm -hmm. and his ideology got him killed for nothing. My husband offered both our futures to stop one fascist bullet from embedding itself into a mud bank. That's the definition of nothing. Like, yeah. I feel the weight of 10,000 widowed women saying the same thing. Right. She is the embodiment of that whole thing. That and also she her nihilism informs so much of the rest of the movie, right? Like, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And that complexity for Oppenheimer as a character is so fucking compelling because I like to think that he is a romantic but the only way he can express himself is through no other lens than scientifically like sure. he's burdened by knowledge so much that in order to pull women he has to like well let me talk about physics and how you know quantum physics says that my body can't pass through yours and right. he like holds up Emily Blunt's hand like that's his fucking line that's yeah. his fucking I dare you to try and pull a woman with that fucking line today that isn't a nerd and see how far <laughs> it goes like it's not gonna fucking work no but it also so on top of that, she, you know, before she has that monologue about her her dead husband, she he asks her, "Who was your first husband?" And she Fucking goes, "Nobody." nobody. But my second <laughs> husband was Joe Dallet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like holy shit. Yeah, Kitty had some uh, some issues to say the least, for sure. Yeah, and this is you know he's flirted with the idea of communism because Oppie is just that kind of much of a vacuum when it comes to knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we've all flirted with the idea <laughs> of all communism, flirted with it, uh-huh. but like that's kind of the crux of the movie. Like that's what comes back to bite him in the ass later on but you know he flirts with the idea of it and instigates Lomanitz and all these other people in his classroom and I didn't talk about that too when he has the one pupil in his classroom and it's the kid from Sex Drive no less oh right yeah just the way Nolan is able to get through time and show you like the passage of time where he you know goes to the chalkboard he starts writing down and it cuts back and now there's more students in his classroom and more Mm -hmm. students in his classroom and he's you know in the lab and he's talking about you know we need to unionize Mm -hmm. and Josh Hartnett coming in and being like what all do you have in common with dock workers right and factory workers 
and they fucking leave and he's telling off he's like you need to understand something he's like you were not just self-important like you were actually important in the world right and i can't bring you on to this secret project that we are doing with the government mm-hmm. because of your fucking left-wing bullshit like you and can't- i can't protect you if yes. you don't stop running your fucking mouth <laughs> and i like well what the fuck why would they even care about what i think he's right. like listen to your fucking phone lines yeah. listen to the sounds that's playing on there look in your rearview mirror when you're coming home stop being so goddamn naive see what's missing from your trash exactly like, yeah. and the fact that like oppie was this fucking intellect mm-hmm. that they had to wrestle with internally because like the scientists are all like yeah he's the fucking guy he knows the fucking theory better than anybody and the u.s government's like well we can't trust him because he's a fucking left-leaning communist sympathizer and all this stuff there is something to the way oppenheimer deals with conflict that must be so infuriating for the people who are arguing with him right like yeah. i'm not that important yeah when he takes the baby to to, to the to hoax house oh my god to chevy yeah yeah and he essentially is just like oh no you want you know what i i am selfish i'm a bad person like yeah. it's, is he really self-aware or is he trying to play them like there's there's always like a little bit of middle ground there i think it's genuine but maybe that's just my naivete myself but like how wild is it to just go to a friend and be like, can you take care of my kid for an indiscriminate amount of time? <laughs> right. Like, Oppie not being able to maintain not only his home life, but one with his drunken wife. Yeah. Swear to God, DC, if you ever call me about your fucking kids. <laughs> It's heartbreaking, man. And he comes hat in hand and Mm -hmm. even acknowledges right away. He's like, this is a selfish thing to ask. Mm -hmm. And I'm ashamed to even ask it. And I love that Chevier, the entire movie, just telling Oppie, like, I understand. Like, you see the world beyond the world. Yeah. And selfish people and awful people don't know they're selfish and awful. Mm -hmm. Like, the levels of empathy and compassion on display here. I don't think there will ever be something of this magnitude warranting this kind of compassion ever again. The Mm -hmm. closest thing I can think of is the Palestine Israel conflict. Mm-hmm. Like everyone knows how important Oppenheimer is, and he's starting to realize it at the same time too. But he kind of wants this home life with the kids and the wife, right? But he can't do that. Maybe I think he also I think he knows that he's supposed to want it. Yeah, you know, like it's that I'm trying so hard to be a person. <laughs> well, he's put in an impossible position because uh-huh. he even tells fucking Josh Hartnett, he's like, I know what it means for the Nazis to have a bomb, and right. Josh Hartnett goes, Well, and I don't. To which Oppie succinctly says, It's not your people they're herding into camps right yeah the weight of that line itself is like a bomb going off but then other people are able to cut straight through to it because they're not like matt when matt damon comes in Oof. like what a fucking entrance but also maybe his best performance of his of his career like maybe he's unbelievable in this movie mm-hmm. uh, i mean yeah i think he's really incredible in interstellar oh, as well yeah. but like he he says you're a dilettante a womanizer and a suspected communist but like people are gonna look the other way because you're brilliant like he just really cuts straight through i love that obby only has a problem with the communist party he's like i'm not a communist he goes i said suspected, a suspected. Like, yeah. <laughs> he also says a, a true Truly fucking insane line. We've got one hope anti-semitism oh my which God. I, like, it's like a record scratch <laughs> <laughs> you're probably wondering how i got here exactly like that is a wild line but like that is the foresight that oppie was burdened or blessed with however you want to look at it like sure. i feel like this is the perfect character study if there ever was to be one because i wrestled back and forth with like should we have made the bomb mm-hmm. should we have dropped it should oppenheimer be the one who is flagellated sure. like, should he be the one that is just ridiculed for all of this and it's impossible to objectively come down on one side or the other like yes i do think objectively no one should have made the bomb and Mm. whoever did make the bomb is therefore responsible for the rest of time knowing that they did that which is i think what oppenheimer felt at the same time but on the other hand it is an impossibly morally gray scenario you are put in where there is no winning solution because either you don't make the bomb and then someone else does like fucking teller tells them until someone makes a bigger bomb right or you run the risk of not making the bomb and then the nazis make the bomb Mm -hmm. and then where are you at then you know what i mean oh and i'm gonna say something controversial oh god i I don't like bombs I knew it was going to be that or the Nazis. I knew I was, I was gambling one way or the other. But Matt Damon asked, why have you never won a Nobel Prize? Mm-hmm. You could maybe win one for this. He's like a Nobel Prize for a bomb, to which obviously says Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. And I was like, yeah, got his ass. I, I mean. love that. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, the whole idea of like, we're banking on the idea that Hitler won't invent a bomb like this. He won't give Heisenberg or Niels Bohr, maybe even to that extent, mm-hmm. the materials that they need to create a bomb because he, quote, 
calls it Jew science. He right. says it to Einstein's face. And so, like, that's their only hope is anti-Semitism. Right. Which, thank fucking God that happened that way. I mean, that's essentially what anti-vaxxers call the COVID vaccine, oh, I too. Know. <laughs> I know. I know. And I gotta tell you, I'm enjoying my 5G. <laughs> it's working. It's working. Yeah. So they build Los Alamos, and when I sit here and think about like the fact that this is not a fiction movie, like right. to know that we really fucking did this, we built a town with schools and churches and homes, not only for scientists but for their families, uh-huh. and we got the very best of the world together. Like I might say something controversial. There is a reason why they were called the Greatest Generation mm. because you know if you put their politics aside in terms of how they viewed women and how they <laughs> viewed people of minority, and that's a huge ask. I know. Yeah, I, I don't know. That I can follow you. I here. know. I know. Uh, listen. <laughs> I'm not saying that they were the greatest generation in terms of their politics or how they viewed the world, Mm. but what they were able to do literally to save the world Uh in the most heinous fucking way possible. I say great in terms of like the The undertaking, the general definition of it, not Uh in terms of like the positivity nature of it. Like, sure. And it's a shame their fucking kids ruined it. These fucking boomers. But anyway, don't you think the generation that built the bomb should have been called boomers? You know what? I'm going to go. No, no, no. You know what? I applaud you. (laughs) Yeah. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I've never heard it get so goddamn quiet (laughs) on this show. I'm sweating. (laughs) The silence is deafening. But no, like, it is crazy to think this was only our grandparents. Yeah. Like, they were splitting the atom and then expanding that in, like, less than five years' time into a bomb Mm -hmm. that can destroy 200,000 people. Yeah. It's not a good thing. It's not a good outcome. But just the fact that scientifically we were able to do that, to harness that. Sure. And then, since then, make a bomb that's 80 times bigger. Mm -hmm. Like, it's fucking wild. I I can't wrap my head around it. I genuinely can't. And then, like, five PlayStations. I know. (laughs) True. You think we'd have more by now with the time that's passed, but there you go. You think we'd have, what was it? We'd have flying cars and no racism. (laughs) You would think. You would think. The Jetsons was a bunch of bullshit. (laughs) You know what? Oppie's view of the world, his philosophy, it didn't quite pan out the way we thought it was going to. No. He's the one who said it. Maybe we all have PlayStation 17 by now, but we didn't. (laughs) That's a quote. That's a quote from him. Jane, get me off this crazy thing. (laughs) And then this is where we get the montage of him recruiting all the different scientists. Mm -hmm. And this movie has so many cameos that it's impossible to stop and uh, just announce them all but we do get Josh <laughs> yeah. Peck for the first time we yeah. do get Jack Quaid for the first time and I love the one scientist that's kind of a holdout and he's like why would I put three years of my life into this project that you can't even tell me what it's about and I love Matt Damon being like why how about because it's the most fucking important thing of the entire world <laughs> like he was just looking he needed to scream at someone that day yeah. exactly I love it that was Christopher Nolan explaining why the bomb had to be practical that was his pitch me to do universal he's like this is the most important fucking movie of all time but uh, uh, he votes got the other scientists that's like, you know, I can't be on this project. Oppie tries to reassure him with, I got skeletons in my closet and they put me in charge. They need us until they don't. Right. And that is the foreshadowing. If there ever was one, that's it. And it's goddamn infuriating. And Krumholtz having that silent moment where he takes his glasses off yep. and just kind of wipes his eyes and he just goes, okay, I'm in. Take off that uniform, though. Yeah. <laughs> Tell Grove to go shit in his hat. <laughs> it's like one of the best lines. Absolutely. And then we get the fuck and superhero suit up sequence. Oh my god! Yeah. It is like Joel Schumacher and Batman and Robin. <laughs> like he's like Dude, they up. do shoot it like a fucking like superhero suit up. It though. is it's so funny. His fucking smoking pipe is his batarang. Like yeah. <laughs> I need the Elliot Goldenthal score to come in. But like seeing Oppie in that military fatigues and like immediately adopting that rhetoric, it is goofy as shit. Because yeah. he kind of like not for nothing in his uniform, he is so close to looking like he's about to march in the blitz. Krieg. Like, it <laughs> yeah. looks so fascist and it's incredible. Like, Crumble's his whole explanation of why he's opposed to this idea is like, if you drop a bomb, you drop it on the just and the unjust. Mm-hmm. And I can't have three centuries of physics culminate in a weapon of mass destruction. Like, well, and Oppie's still fooling himself into thinking, no, no, no. When, when Once we get to that point, I'll have been able to convince everybody not to drop it on children. You know what it is? Mm. We're still having the same argument today with, well, the only person that could stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun uh-huh. and i saw on twitter recently it was a video the of a, willy wonka experience well i saw that too but 
<laughs> it's a white erase board. Oh yeah, that doubles as a room that kids Shield. can hide in—a panic room, basically. What? Ugh, yeah, I saw that too. It's literally a white board. You pull a handle, and it collapses outward to where children can funnel in and close a door. It's basically a panic room that's portable. Now, truly, I do want one, but <laughs> I I hate that it exists. It is the most dystopian thing I can think of. Yeah, the only thing that would have made it worse if it was branded with like I don't know Coca Cola presents the fucking <laughs> collapsible room and I'm like I don't want to be alive anymore I right. don't want to be I don't want to be on this planet anymore <laughs> like it's so fucked that we're still having these same like it doesn't work a bad guy with a gun is not defeated by a good guy with a gun mm-hmm. and this movie is telling you that and I think that's why people gravitated to this movie because it is the most prescient lesson that we could learn right now mm-hmm. and we're still fucking we still have fucking Nazis today we're st- still not doing it still not fucking doing it we haven't learned a goddamn thing yeah and I, again that's why this is the ultimate silver lining movie but anyway Benny Safdie strolls in hey guys with the most unruly eyebrows I've ever seen mm-hmm. which is hilarious because a Apparently, Nolan told him, don't trim your eyebrows. Let them fucking grow. Let them just get unfucking hinged. Well, because Edward Teller had those fucking Ed Asner eyebrows. God damn. Like Eugene Levy strolling in here. But like, it is. (laughs) Benny Safdie is somehow becoming like our most unsung character actor and also one of the finest film directors of our time. Like, it is. It's fucking wild how good he is. Yeah. And, you know, this is where he comes in and he does this equation and he says, listen, there is a very real possibility because, again, this is all theory. Mm -hmm. We don't know until we actually try it that when we start this reaction to create this bomb, it starts a chain reaction that never fucking ends. Mm -hmm. It will ignite the atmosphere and we will literally destroy the world. Yep. And so Oppie's like, run these numbers again. I'm going to go talk to Einstein and get his input on it. And Einstein, you know, again, walking in the woods with James Urbaniak, Uh he reads the equation and he's like, this is what it's come to. He's Mm -hmm. like, there is a non-zero chance this happens. And knowing that this was a thing, there was a very real possibility Mm -hmm. that this detonation destroys fucking everything. And did everything. Everything. And they were just like, let's roll them dice. And I love Einstein's response of like, because Oppie asked him, what do we do? here mm-hmm. if this equation we go back and run the numbers again and it's accurate he goes you immediately go tell the nazis mm-hmm. the weight of that alone is like not only are you announcing to the nazis we're thinking about creating a bomb in the manner of the british of like splitting the atom mm-hmm. but like if we do and it destroys the world our greatest fucking enemy probably the greatest enemy in mankind's history mm-hmm. we have to tell them hey don't fucking do this this is a step too far yeah don't pull that trigger yeah. like it's not just gonna hit us yeah i know you're putting people into ovens and <sighs> gas chambers mm. and like destroying the world already mm. metaphorically and physically but you will literally destroy the world and that's Einstein's go to as a German himself he's like you gotta go fucking tell him yeah you know it's no wonder people back then aged like shit because <laughs> could you imagine the stress of that knowledge of like we're playing God yeah. like no one has ever played it before and if it's true we have to go tell the grossest people to have ever existed <laughs> right I have to sit Hitler down and hope he listens to reason yeah yeah seems understandable <laughs> this is where the chevier incident happens as well where he talks to oppenheimer he's like look i got a friend you know like that, that guy eltonton uh, that you met that one time in this movie right well he's got friends that are russian and he's saying you know russia's our allies at this point and you know we're not telling them what's going on that i i feel like chevier kind of knows already that they're building a bomb or something like that but yeah. he's like you know uh, maybe if you want to get some information to our allies elton can do it through uh non-official channels Mm -hmm. that's got to be so fucking scary dude as oppenheimer and you can see it on his face too of like you were suggesting treason you were the man taking care of my children right and i'm already dealing with the stress of knowing we're about to create the most powerful weapon mankind's ever known and just having this conversation with you could fuck everything up just hearing you say these words where you can't know that you think this yeah (laughs) it's like when you go to the doctor and you're like, ah, my friend thinks that. Like, no, 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 no. Even that alone is too fucking much. Yeah. And especially as a Jewish man himself, hearing these words of like, I could be charged with treason during World War II. Right. Mm-hmm. No fucking thanks. No thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Benny Safdie is at the same time trying to argue for the creation of a hydrogen bomb versus an atomic bomb. Mm-hmm. But it's so funny because he's like, well, in order to do my bomb, I kind of need your bomb. So we kind of might as well just keep moving forward. Yeah. Make your bomb good so that mine can be even cooler. Exactly. And this is where we find out that there is a leak at Los Alamos because we cut back to present day mm-hmm. where 
Strauss and Matthew Modine and even like a kind of reveal of Dave and Dehaud sitting at the table too. Oh, They're man. all talking about another look. great reveal. <laughs> Speaking of people who like disappeared for a while, I know. Fuck, man, he's so good in this movie too. I love Nichols, yeah, and I like quarters too. Hey, God, <laughs> and Boo. Russia sets this bomb off. Robert Downey looks at the paperwork. He's like. This is only possible if they had information from what you guys did at Los Alamos. Right. Oppie is the entire time insisted there was no spy at Los Alamos. No and leak. I love the line where Downey holds out the paper and says, Robert, they just fired a starting gun. Yeah. Like they know what you guys did and they're doing it too. And they're now they're on the way to making a hydrogen bomb before we're able to do it. Right. I love that because we find out at the end of the movie that Klaus Fuchs was the spy mm-hmm. for Russia, who then, you know, they they created the bomb with his materials. Yeah. The way this movie is so brilliant about selling you on the fact that it couldn't have been Fuchs because one he's only really in one scene and it's where he gets introduced uh-huh. and I love that you know he's clearly got a German name and he gets introduced as being from Britain and Oppie says when did you become British he says because Hitler told me I wasn't German yeah you immediately buy that guy you're like okay I get why that guy's here yeah you know what I mean yeah it's fucking incredible and this whole movie is filled with that it also helps that like we are presented with Nichols as clearly the aggressor here, a right? Like, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and even during the hearing when we flash forward in time, Oppie gets that little dig in where he's like, security was tight as former Colonel Nichols well knows. Yeah. Like, we're presented with Nichols being this unreliable conspirator, but he was fucking right. Nichols also has a very good rebuttal there. He was like, compartmentalization was done as well as it could be uh-huh. because you had people like Oppenheimer who were not complicit with it because right. he's like, I'm going to go to Chicago, check in on the first ever nuclear reactor on U.S. soil that is under a fucking football field. Bain stole that idea. <laughs> He was like, I'm going to go check whether I have security clearance or not. Right. I mean, the fact that he didn't have security clearance in the first place is right. the man leading the charge in the creation of this thing. Right. And like, when you couple that with the fact that he was Jewish uh-huh. and the fact that a leak did come out, it's no wonder that people, whether through negative intentions or not, draw the conclusion that he must have had communist sympathies or that he was a Russian asset or something. It, it all tracks so perfectly. And Nolan is so smart in the way he's cast these characters in every small little bit too, right? Mm-hmm. Like. He knows that the shorthand of an audience seeing Dane DeHaan, you're going to be like, oh, well, that guy's bad news. That's fucking (laughs) place beyond the pines. I don't trust this guy at all. What he even says, too, he's like, the fact that your security clearance hasn't been cleared up by yet or is running late is not my fucking problem. Right. Yeah. You expect this guy to be like, he's got some fucking edge against fucking Oppie for whatever reason. He pulls that little bitch move where he holds out the card and then like yanks it back. He's like, you know, no funny business or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, and when they're at that round table, too, and Robert Downey Jr. is just fucking confronting Oppie about, look, there clearly was a spy at Los Alamos. Like his, It's not a question. Yeah. I'm not asking you was there. I'm telling you there was. Yeah. And his seething resentment, because this has got to be post him turning down the Institute job or whatever. Yes. It is fucking palpable. Yeah. Like Robert Downey Jr. in this movie is maybe got 20 minutes of screen time, yeah. but it's the villain of the fucking movie. Yes. And it's probably better than the entire work he's done in the MCU. Like, mm. I don't think it's even questionable. And I like him as Iron Man, but man, seeing him especially when he blows up at Aaron Reich at the end of this movie oh my and he's God. like fucking Oppenheimer should be thanking me for all that I did for him and I love Alden Aaron Reich I'm like well he's not yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You watch Robert Downey just bursting with anger and then immediately just withdraw and like realize he's defeated. It's an, it's a powerhouse fucking performance. Mm -hmm. So Oppie goes to Chicago. He gets introduced to Robin Malik. And (laughs) on my first watch in the theater, I was like, this is so weird for Robin Malik to have a cameo with no fucking lines. Right. And the fact that he kept coming back throughout the movie and the fact that he's dropping that bombshell at the end was so fucking rewarding. But, Mm -hmm. you know, they're making this nuclear reactor under Chicago under the football field. And Sizzlard, who is like the guy that wrote two rows about saying look we can make a bomb for you Mm -hmm. and for him to then later be the one kind of leading the forefront of like we gotta fucking stop with this bomb shit (laughs) (laughs) yeah and then we get this maybe the best visual motif i've seen in an Nolan movie with the glass bowl representing how much you know uranium and plutonium they've created with the marbles it's Mm -hmm. such a great way of showing the passing of time and showing like just how much of a fucking operation this thing was Mm -hmm. like it took months to make three pebbles worth of uranium and plutonium but also the ways in which they were making this palatable for them, right? Like yeah. They made it into sort of a game in order to keep going. It's Nolan's way of, look, I know this is a bunch of jargon. I know uh-huh. you're not following
questioning all of the science of this. Let me break it down in the most simple thing I can do. <laughs> so thankfully, Benny Safdie says, uh, my bomb will be bigger bowl or yeah. whatever, whatever the line <laughs> is. Like, <laughs> which is so good. It literally will be a super bowl. Right. Like, that's exactly what it will be. And yeah, that's just one of the many ways of fixing like the common man translation of all that. So mm-hmm. you can keep track of everything that's happening. But it's so smart. It's so smart. And there is something to be said about basic human impulses, too, because mm. we find out that Oppie went and saw Gene Tatlock. Right. And he's just a guy. Like, he's a vulnerable guy. Right. But he makes it sound to the council like he was like, well, I was doing something kind by going to see her, right? Yeah, he was getting laid. That's exactly. What he was but he was like, well, I, you know, I felt that she needed to see me. And mm-hmm. I was like, no, you, you were going to get laid. And yeah, exactly. And this is where the true sex scene of the movie happens. It's and haunting. To anyone that... That saw this scene of Florence Pugh naked riding Killian Murphy naked in front of this boardroom in front of Emily Blunt and all you thought was titillization I don't think you're ready for big boy movies I don't think you're ready for grown up movies you should go back to the MCU or whatever the fuck you're watching we are seeing how humiliated Emily Blunt is exactly. in this moment she says it she's like because Oppie says look I didn't tell them anything you didn't already know she goes yeah but now the whole fucking world knows you spoke it into existence she says now it belongs to history yep. she is visualizing what she already knew was there but now she's visualizing not only her husband being humiliated in this room mm-hmm. being just talked down to and not putting up a fight about it mm-hmm. but also confronting the fact that he had an affair with her mm-hmm. with a person that arguably was absolutely mentally ill to the point of it destroying her husband like well he was already on a war path but yeah. like i i think it was mutually assured destruction <laughs> (laughs) in this relationship much like the bombs race was and i think that like this is maybe the most necessary sex scene that i've seen in a movie in quite some time but like she's realizing that this hearing in that moment feels like it was more important to him than their relationship was like she says you were under oath to me when you went to see gene exactly And Jean is clearly mentally unstable, but Oppie tells her, like, look, you asked me to come visit you. I'm glad I did, but this is the last time I can possibly see you. Mm -hmm. And to know that within days after that, she's dead in the bathtub. And I got to ask, on the first watch, who saw the black glove? Oh, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I did not. Wow. It went right over me. And on this rewatch, man, I had already known about it by that time. That is the scariest fucking image in the movie to me. It's terrifying. And it's, there are theories that it wasn't a suicide. It's pretty commonly accepted that it was a suicide but the the fact that they play with that that moment of doubt in his mind is terrifying horrifying dude holy shit something i thought about on the third time of you know watching this movie was did oppie tell her about gadget in this moment right because he tells her i i can't see you again she says what if i need you you said you would always answer if i called Mm -hmm. and then she says not a word Mm -hmm. and it just cuts away from that scene and so I think there's credence and at least what Nolan is maybe hinting at is that it might have been Colonel Pash that fucking killed Gene Tatlock. Because it is sort of implied in an odd way, but it also is Nolan saying, regardless if it was someone else's hand because she knew too much or because he rejected her, he feels the blood is on his hands, right? Exactly. She was dying either way, probably. Right. More probably than not. But you're right. It helps that immediately we're introduced to Colonel Pash, who oh is God. a fucking terrifying lizard man. Yeah. Casey Affleck in this scene is fucking scary as fuck. Yeah. And the fact that Matt Damon is afraid of him, he's like, that guy, you talk to that guy? (laughs) Matt Damon's reaction to this is so fucking funny. I would never put you in a room with Casey Affleck. Are you out of your fucking mind? (laughs) He's like, he's killed more communists with his bare hands than you could even imagine. He's yeah. like, he's the son of a Russian Orthodox priest. And yeah, I think that's what clicked for me this time is like, they're hinting that maybe it was Pash that killed him. Maybe yeah. it was the government and Jodron that killed Tatlock. I mean, he literally says like, Pash wanted to kill Lominitz. So like, play it cool when you talk to him. <laughs> he was going to kill a college student who just wanted to unionize the lab workers. <laughs> yeah. He's like, he was said he was going to drag him out into the middle of a lake on a boat and torture him, quote, the Russian manner. It is fucking haunting the little bit of screen time that Casey Affleck has and what he is able to do 
with that. It's crazy. And Affleck plays it so coy, but also like oblivious. Like when he says like, well, you know, why would anybody want to leak information? Like yeah. the smile that he gives him with those dead fucking eyes oh. is, yeah, it's chilling. Well, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of like in uh, Star Trek Troopers with like, <laughs> would you like to know more? Because he's like, I would like to get the details about that. Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. But also like he doesn't want to tell on his friends and instead he makes things worse and worse as he tries not to get people in trouble because his answers become more and more abstract yeah and he's like look i know you want me to tell you the name but i'm not gonna get anybody in trouble Mm -hmm. and it doesn't fucking matter because later on you know they're having the conference like did you find out who it was before he told you he goes no you know it was rather difficult not having the name but when he told us we see fucking chevier on exile in france like don't worry about it he got the fuck out of there right and i do love that because matt damon tells him look i can't protect you unless you give me the name Mm -hmm. and i'll be goes well if you ask me for the name i'll give it to you he goes no 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 no. you need to volunteer chevier's name yeah it doesn't look good if i have to order you to cooperate exactly and i do love the little reveal then that groves did help him yeah because when pash is given that statement he's like you know well why didn't you go after chevy then he goes well i got reassigned yeah transferred to europe exactly he goes well who reassigned you groves did yeah that's what oppie finally realizes it years decades later and like oh groves did protect me he did have someone looking out for him exactly yeah and uh, this is where we get the Christmas party. Jack Quaid playing the bongos yeah. and uh, a surprise Niels Bohr yeah. fucking present coming early. <laughs> and I do love that the first thing he says to Oppie is, is it big enough? And I'm like, hey, man, <laughs> we're in public. You got to chill out with that. <laughs> and he's like, oh, what, to end the war? And he goes, no, to end all war. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's, I got to fucking chill, man. The hubris that we thought this was going to do. And that plays into Oppie's whole philosophy of like, if we just demonstrate the usefulness of this bomb once, we'll never have to again. And I'm right. like, the naivete you fucking had and brana kind of feeds into that right like he says this isn't just a new weapon it's a new world you're creating mm-hmm. he was like there is before creating the bomb and after creating the bomb yeah like, there is no this is the two moments in history that we're dealing with here and gene tatlock is killed and oppie is out in the woods grieving yeah. and i do love this is where he confesses basically to uh, katie that he's been seeing her and she says you don't get to commit the sin and then have everyone else feel guilty for you because there are consequences yeah i love that moment she is able to drop these wisdom bombs just much like he's dropping the real bomb like it's fucking crazy <laughs> i want more of their relationship yes. but it's this moment and it's the sort of grammar lesson that she gives later on yeah. that really sells kitty for me and they're relationship and that's like a verbatim fucking confrontation too i know isn't that crazy crazy so good but like the idea because this has got to be where nolan's playing with a little bit of humor because like he's sitting there grieving in the middle of the woods Mm -hmm. we cut to that same shot that everyone saw of killian murphy just you know hands on the temple is just reeling with the fact that tatlock was murdered yeah and we have this conversation between this male and female scientists where they're arguing over if the bomb could do more damage to the female reproductive organs Mm -hmm. or the male reproductive organs. it's a wild juxtaposition (laughs) yeah right it is nuts and it tells you like god these were the kind of conversations you had every day Mm -hmm. and you had to just kind of laugh them off (laughs) and then um we cut back to like post russia having a bomb Mm -hmm. and izzy is drawing on the map on the table of like the hydrogen bomb is 80 times more powerful than the atom bomb right strauss is asking him can you draw on me on the map what it would look like if those bombs would go off in u.s cities like what would the devastation have looked like and in his head oppie starts hearing this motif of these feet stomping yeah it's a brilliant fucking motif that he brings back and forth but we're almost there and oppie is still having these sort of circular arguments right like if we build one the russians will build one but they don't know that we have one so why would we reveal it yeah exactly we can't tell him because then we'll admit that we have one he's like well i think they already know we have one (laughs) right and he says the world will not fear it till they understand it and they won't understand it until they use it yep it's like peace the long way around is like what he's hoping the plan is yeah and the visualization of the water drops on the map of the table. Oh my god, that shot's amazing. Symbolizing the bombs dropping. Yeah. Comes full circle from the beginning of the movie. And this is like already the halfway point. Mm-hmm. And then when you couple that with the end of the movie too, it's it's a fucking masterclass in editing and screenwriting. Yeah. But uh then we get introduced to David Dasmalchian playing Ugh. Borden. I've who, said this on the show before when we did our prisoners episode, but anytime he pops into a movie, immediately I'm just like, now we got ourselves a picture. Right? <laughs> this is a motion picture now, boys. We're in. <laughs> 
I fucking love that guy. Finally playing a fully realized character, not just some little gremlin, even though he's a little bit of a gremlin too. <laughs> yes. Well, he's a fully realized gremlin. He is a fully realized gremlin. That's fair to say. This movie is such a great collection of some of our finest weird little guys. Yes. Mm-hmm. Rami Malek, you got Dane the Hard, you got everybody just poking around here and there. Scott Grimes, <laughs> Macon Blair. Fucking Rami Malek is skulking around in a little bunker the whole fucking time. I wrote, ah, Rami Malek. <laughs> Um, oh, you know, that's who the movie was missing, you know, now that I think about <laughs> it. Rory Kinnear? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> we were missing some Rory Kinnear. It is amazing, too, because I clocked this on the second time watch this movie, that only after Hitler is dead do we get even the hint that Japan is a part of this conflict, too. Right. right? Unless you know your history, obviously, but, like, Japan's not mentioned until after Hitler goes up. Yep. And the scientists are, like, having this adjacent communist meeting of, yeah. like... Look, Hitler's dead. Germany's about to admit defeat. We don't even need to finish making this bomb. Sillard is like, we were building the bomb to fight Germany. Yeah. And, th- and everyone else is like, well, that's not really how manufacturing works. Exactly. <laughs> and this is where Oppie has come back to that fascist ideal point mm-hmm. and that military fatigues. Like, he might as well be walking in with those. And he's yeah. like, if you're going to drop a bomb, that is how they understand. Yeah. You know, and they will never have to do this again. He's speaking from the Groves and the Truman point of view here. Right. Which I thought was crazy because, like, this is your chance to walk away. Mm-hmm. You did it. And he even tells people, he goes, when they find out what we were doing here, whether we dropped the bomb or not, it's too late. Right. The mere existence of the Manhattan Project existing, like, it's it's enough to ensure world peace. That's his thinking. Yes. The arrogance is outstanding. It's, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. Like, this is the most interesting and philosophical discussion worth having in our time, I think, is like... Do you make the bomb knowing that it's going to have to be used? Mm-hmm. Like, it goes back to the Dark Knight where he's like, you know what the purpose of a bomb is? It's to go off. Right. Like That's the whole fucking point. For a while, he's making the argument, just having the idea of the bomb is scary enough to deter them. Exactly. Okay, well, just having the bomb and not using it is scary enough. And now he's in a room with other men trying to decide where to drop it. And he's like, if we just shit. Now he's at the point where he's arguing, we don't have to drop it on people. Yeah. They'll just see the blast and they'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this James Remar scene Fuck. is incredible because it's like you got all these people debating like where do we draw this bomb yeah and Oppie is explaining the psychological impact of just having the bomb they're having two different conversations that yes. are not relative to one another and right exactly he's trying to convince them like yeah drop it in the middle of the desert and they're like well if we drop it in the first place and it doesn't go off we completely just wiped off any potential possibility of Japan surrendering because right. to our western mindset and our sentimentalities we can't comprehend the fact that like this tiny island is going to try and fight the rest of the war, even though Germany has surrendered at this point. Mm-hmm. And like, I love that Matt Damon is like as much of a friend as he's tried to beat up. He's like, look, we intend to draw this bomb twice. We're going to fucking do it. Yeah. And in that line that James Remar have is, I've got 12 potential targets. Oh, wait a minute. Make that 11. Yeah. I'm going to take Kyoto off the list of potentials because of its cultural impact to the Japanese people. Dot, dot, dot. And also me and my wife honeymoon there. <sighs> it's so so fucked. It is disgusting to fucking hear. Yeah. And what's crazy is James Remar came to Nolan with that notion and said, mm-hmm. hey, just so you know, this guy did honeymoon in Kyoto. I think it'd be worth mentioning this. And no one else can find out where he found that information out. Yeah. Like, there is, there's no definitive proof. That's a debate on its own now. No. Yeah. Even still, it's Surely, it definitely <laughs> signifies what this whole fucking thing is. You really drew that ass out there. For- I've been drinking a little bit of whiskey this whole episode. Sorry. <laughs> it's surely. Even with all of that, it is truly remarkable to think about what human beings were able to accomplish at this time. Like, it neutralized everything in a miles wide radius. Yeah. And all that intelligence is squandered on the notion that a person with blue eyes and blonde hair is superior to someone with brown eyes and brown hair. Yeah. Like, I think back to that line from Terminator 2 where he's like, it's in your nature to destroy each other. And I'm like, yeah, fuck it. Yeah. We might as well just fucking do it. Let's just get it over with. I think Fry even Futurama's got a good line. It's like, it's the waiting that I can't stand. <laughs> right. like, I can't, if we're going to do it, let's fucking do it. And the fact that even up until detonation, they had no idea if this thing was going to literally destroy the world. Mm-hmm. I think I'd go into cardiac arrest during this countdown. Like, yeah. I wouldn't even be alive to see it go off. I will say an unintentional laugh, maybe, but Emily Blunt tells Oppenheimer, break a leg, yeah. <laughs> and we cut to that small implosion test, and I literally was like, well, that's not very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> 
this countdown to the bomb going off begins because they're trying to do two tests at least at the same time. Yes. One of an implosion device and one of the smaller bomb rocketing into the bigger bomb. The implosion test fails. Mm-hmm. So they've only got one shot at this. And I'm going to say something again that's maybe controversial, but mm. shocking. I never really saw Matt Damon as like a truly great prestigious actor. Mm. Like I've enjoyed his performances, but I've never been able to see him disappear into a role or see him pull off something that I haven't seen him do a million times. Mm. This scene where he is having this conversation about the test detonation, Oof. he's fucking dialed in. Oh, like, yeah. He makes it clear that like he's not an idiot because earlier on when one of the scientists quits, mm-hmm. he says, I'm just a humble soldier, Doc, because you're neither humble nor a soldier. You studied physics at MIT. Mm-hmm. He's not an idiot. He knows exactly what they're all doing. Uh-huh. Yeah. So are you saying we're some kind of suicide squad? <laughs> God damn <laughs> he it. Says, he says like, what's the chances of this happening? He goes, it's non-zero. And he goes, non-zero? He goes, well, what do you want from theory alone? He goes, I don't know, maybe Fucking zero? zero. <laughs> yeah. nice. I kind of wish they hadn't put that line in the trailer. I know. Yeah. yeah. Because it's such a good bit. I wanted 30 more seconds of just these two just in each other's company. Staring at each other? Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Just broing out for a minute? Yeah. Honest to God, not even talking. Yeah, just them just experiencing the weight. Like, they are two hours away from maybe not only their careers being over, but the fucking world being over. Yeah. And you see that on Matt Damon's face in this scene of like, I've put two billion dollars, three years of work into this thing that may inevitably be the death of everything it's not even your legacy right it's like there's no y- you just end it it's it's done yeah and then you know we get of course benny safty soaking himself in sunscreen with fucking goggles it's pretty good teller has too much fucking shit on him <laughs> <you know? laughs> this was the year of like guys in weird goggles right because de niro in killers of the flower moon <laughs> yeah yeah i love that that's one of like the promotional photos they use yeah. it's just such a brilliant call it's great and then, man, this countdown is so fucking stressful. You Jesus got Christ. Josh Peck's hand trembling over the abort button. Fucking God. The New Year's fucking they wish. Yeah. <laughs> the men lying down on the mattresses, the Ugh. scores crescendoing, Killian Murphy muttering to himself, these things are hard on your heart. Oh, my God. That Oof. line. Ugh. Yeah. It'll get you. Mm-hmm. It is such a brilliant stroke, but also just so much reserve nature to just not put the shockwave of the bomb yeah. and to just have pure silence and Killian Murphy breathing over this detonation. It, it's visually awesome. Ludwig Gorenson, he composed so much fucking music for this movie that when it's not playing- You feel it. It yeah. hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You feel its absence and it, oh my God, it, it literally sucked the air out of the room in the theater when this bomb went off i expected you know as i realized it was going to be silent to hear like noise from another theater next door or something Mm -hmm. i didn't hear anything but gasp yeah and it took my breath away this moment solidifies itself so fucking well and if you're not sold on this movie up to this point i don't know what to tell you Uh this is a fucking master at work and this scene is one of the most impressive things i've ever seen yeah (laughs) it's so fucking incredible and yeah it just you know i've now become death destroyer of worlds yeah he tells kitty bring in the sheets which is their code word of telling him that it was successful yeah and he's sitting there with Matt Damon and he's like you know what do we do now he's like well we've given Truman and the boys an ace it's up for them to handle it yeah and he's talking to Teller and he's like once you know they use this bomb war becomes unthinkable yeah but then I love Teller coming back he goes until someone builds a bigger bomb yeah he says to Groves shall I come with you to Washington and Groves is like what for yeah for what Yeah. (laughs) like his part is done yeah the shot that got me was after the explosion we cut to the next day everyone's celebrating and the prominent of American fucking flag in the background when he's like lifted a lot. Oh my like, god. It's not subtle, but it's really impactful. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I do love that Taylor did go on to make the bigger bomb, the yeah. father of the hydrogen bomb. And then, yeah, he sits there and waits because he's like, oh, they're going to drop the bomb on the 6th. Yeah. Maybe Truman will call you. Maybe the boys in Washington will give you a heads up. And he's just waiting by the phone, waiting and waiting. This is when Emily Blunt steps out like the Babadook. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, I thought they'd call. She goes, well, it's only the 5th. And then he's at the office the next day. And Truman comes on over the radio. Yeah. And says, we dropped a bomb that is 20,000 tons of TNT. Yeah. It is the basic harness of human power. Man. The mournful handshakes of of the scientists inside yeah. versus the military guys like hooping and hollering outside. It's gross. It's mm-hmm. hard to watch. It's fucking devastating, dude. Man, it's just like 
it's outside the realm of reality. Like yeah. I can't fathom your hands touched the machine that blew up 200,000 people. Yeah. Innocent people, by the way. Yeah. And to find out that there's like 20 prisoners of war right. in Japan of our side that got obliterated during this thing. Mm-hmm. And as scary as the Gene Tatlock murder suicide scene was, and as scary as Colonel Pash was, mm-hmm. nothing in this movie to me is as scary as the gymnasium scene. Yes. Yeah. I wrote down this is Nolan's horror movie. Yeah. It is the most haunting thing imaginable. It's and like he did that interview a few weeks ago where he was like, oh, I'd make a horror movie. Bro, you did it. He, he said did. he wants to make a horror movie. I think he could fucking do it. Mm-hmm. I think if you really want to do it, give him like a $10 million budget. Oh, yeah. Cut him at the knees and see what he fucking does. And I think he'll fucking deliver. But like it starts off on the wrong, like everything feels wrong, right? Like yeah. he's hearing the noise of the marching feet. He's trying his best to be jingoistic. Yeah. Like it is so against Oppenheimer's nature to say shit like, well, I bet the Japanese didn't like it. Like, it is disgusting. Yeah, that line is fucked. Yeah, I think it's maybe the best scene Nolan has ever directed. Yeah. Damn. Flat out, period. I think it's the best thing he's ever done. I think you're right. Yeah. The room vibrating around him, the one scream that cuts its way through the sound. That scream, I started bawling in the theater. Like, that scream scared the fucking shit out of me. And I cannot understand the people that criticize this movie and say, we should have seen the bomb drop on Japan. I'm like, less is so much fucking more here. Like, yeah. Did you learn nothing from Jaws? <laughs> and again, I will I will say, we have those movies. Yeah. Like, those movies exist. That's not the story that's being told in this one. And you don't need it because the shriek of terror that arises out of that applause. Yeah. And him seeing that ash fall over the empty theater, him stepping in that corpse. Into a person. Yeah. And seeing Christopher Nolan's daughter's face melt off. Oh, oh my, God. my God. And just like the silence is fucking deafening. Mm-hmm. You watch Oppie try to convince himself what he did was just and right when the literal world around him is trembling. Like yeah. the weight of that is unfathomable. Yeah. These people look straight out of some of the Stratton Oakmont fucking brokers. Like the way they're seething with yep. nationalist excitement. Like, absolutely. I expected Matthew McConaughey to be in there pumping his chest. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking wild. And you see, like, a woman crying. You see a couple making out. There's a guy puking his fucking guts out. Like, yeah. it's otherworldly. I, I don't have the words to describe what I felt in that moment. But it is all negative. Yeah. <laughs> it is a fucking bomb going off. Yeah. I, I know I've said it a ton of times in this episode, but the weight of that moment, it's... If I'm Oppenheimer, I go and hang myself in my fucking office. <laughs> like, it's done. It's telling you how much the world has changed and how awful this is without, like... What is the expectation here, right? Like, would people be happy if they then cut to footage of dead bodies in the aftermath of the bombings? I don't think that that's... That's that's not storytelling. I don't know. Well, Griffin Newman on Blank Check summarized it perfectly. It's like, what do you, you do one of two things. You show historical footage, which seems exploitative. Sure. Or you show a dramatization of it, in which case, then you're just stuffing it too much. You're overfilling it. That's a different movie. Exactly. Oppie's reaction here is enough to convince me that what we did was fucking awful, and yeah. he knows it. And he hates himself for it. And it cuts to him on the cover of Time. Right. Like, person of the year, the father of the atomic bomb. He's dealing with that right in that moment. We don't need to see it. And to know that he then goes to Truman and has a nervous breakdown and just explains to him like, sir, I feel like I've got blood on my hands. I'm responsible for all this. And man, Truman taking out that handkerchief and waving it in his fucking face. (sighs) It is wild. Which he really did. He did. And he says, do you think anyone in Nagasaki or Hiroshima gives a shit who built the bomb? They care who dropped it. I did. Yeah. He doesn't give a fuck. And he asked him, he's like, what should we do with Los Alamos? He's like, oh, give, give it, it back, back to, to the, the Indians. Indians. Yeah. And Truman's like, no, you fucking idiot. We build up. He won't even respond. Yeah. The fucking vice president's like, no, we fucking build up. Yeah. If anything. Yeah. And he predicts, he's like, Russia is going to build a bigger bomb next. Mm-hmm. And I love Truman going, well, do you know when Russia's going to have the bomb? Never. Ugh. They're never going to fucking have the bomb. Like, that is the arrogance yes. of American. Like, we think we're the father of the atomic bomb. No, you just gave everyone else the cheat sheet on how to fucking do it. Yeah. And the fact that, like, he correctly predicted the fucking Cold War that lasted, like, fucking 50 years. Yeah. Like, it's fucking nuts. And it can't be understated how much Gary Oldman comes in for three minutes of screen time. Destroys. Absolutely. Destroys 
just <laughs> he is the cartoon villain yeah. that like there's an honesty to the performance yeah. there is a realism to it that is just you don't want to accept that this is real and i remember i was talking about this with ashley and i was just like yeah he really fucking did that. like yeah. he gave him the handkerchief he said the thing about the crybaby and don't like let that crybaby back in here oh Ooh, yeah <laughs> I remember scoffing in the theater, be like, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then we find out that Fuchs was the spy. Mm-hmm. And it's such a blow to Oppie because he truly believed in everyone on this project. And we kind of now are dealing with the aftermath, right? We dropped the bomb. Now what happened? Uh huh. And Oppenheimer can't even look at the pictures of the devastation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're showing the slideshow. You hear the gas from the audience. And he thought he was creating a device of peace and accomplished the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. Like it is, it's so fucking gross. And then, meanwhile, all the scientists are being blacklisted yep. because, uh, you know, we're going to take it from here. Yeah. Frank is blacklisted from teaching. Lominitz yeah. gets sent to the railroads. <laughs> Right. Ugh. We're becoming more insulated. And speaking of the Time magazine, this is where Strauss is talking about, like in this interview, this whole meeting at, for the cabinet position, mm-hmm. and they keep asking about Oppenheimer. And he's like, what if we pivot? What if we look, say, like, look, the US fought Oppenheimer and the US fucking won. Uh huh. And I'm part of that. And then this is where Aaron Wright gets the copy of the new issue of Time that's coming out with Strauss on it. Right. And he reads the caption Oppenheimer was tough, but the US won. Yeah. And then this is where all the pieces fall into place. He's like, because at this point in the hearing, we forgot to talk about Borden, David Dasmanchian, sent a letter to the FBI with all his findings saying, look, I believe that Oppenheimer was a Russian asset. Mm-hmm. I believe he had ties to communist parties. This is my findings. And the only way he could have gotten that bit of information about Oppie is with a security file that only Nichols had access to. And this is where we get the reveal that Strauss Man, gave him. We've seen this meeting between Nichols and Borden twice. Yeah. And then finally, we pan over to show Strauss in the room. Like, holy shit shit yeah it's so well deployed and kitty being the only one seeing the forest of the trees they're all like oh it's got to be bored and what's borden's angler and she's like no it's fucking straws right you humiliated him on more than one occasion right he's like well that was years ago and kitty goes well the vindictive are patient as saints <laughs> like and she's not wrong yeah. she's so right and straw summarizes it best when he says amateurs seek the sun and get eaten power stays in the shadows right what a fucking line well and it's proven because he's been laying traps for oppenheimer for years Years. Yeah. He's got recordings from 12 years ago. He's uh-huh. he's talked to Lawrence about the fact that Oppenheimer was fucking Richard's wife. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. It's just nuts. But it's cool because he never found out. Right. <laughs> it's so right. cool. And Nolan is so good at succinctly summarizing humanity and bureaucracy in a single sentence because mm-hmm. that power line, we're talking about Prometheus this whole movie too, right? And that's Icarus. Uh-huh. Like he flies too close to the fucking sun trying to get one over on Oppie, like being humiliated at the conference about Norwegian ice the togues getting humiliated at what he thinks is a slight against him in front of einstein right all of this is shit that doesn't even cross oppie's mind he doesn't even give a shit about Strauss whatsoever right he, like you said he really is bearing the weight of guilt and not just feeling self-important mm-hmm. yeah it's just like all this stuff coming out about his personal life all the affairs that he was just like an intellectual that's all he was that's all he had ties to with the communist party he was interested in them mm-hmm. and sending money to spanish refugees and trying to help out with the spanish civil war and they're like I love that moment when Kitty is being interviewed by Roger Robb and he's like so he was sending uh, you know money to the communist party she was not to through yeah through the communist party he was using those people to get money to people that needed it yeah he was sending money to the destitute yeah. not to the bigwigs or you know the, whoever was working against us exactly yeah. and he's like oh don't you think he had communist ties or whatever and he's like you had communist ties too right she goes not for 16 years no wait 17 and he starts talking she goes 18 right just trying to discredit him at every point and not playing the fucking game because she's the only one that does fight back even right. as much as izzy tries to he doesn't really fight back mm-hmm. teller doesn't fight back lawrence doesn't fight back no one fights for oppie when they're in his corner yep she even admits that this thing has been predetermined there's no way they're gonna win this but kitty is determined that like i'm not gonna make this easy for them yeah. i'm going to push back i'm gonna make them feel as humiliated as i have and the parallels too between this quote-unquote not a trial versus mm-hmm. strauss's quote-unquote not 
a trial as both they keep saying over and over in this movie this is not a trial you don't get the judiciary fucking benefits of it being a trial it's a uh-huh. fucking trial it's a yeah. fucking trial for sure and it is a smear campaign designed to do one thing discredit them in both of their fucking trials there's no burden of proof exactly. we're not convicting just denying yeah making Blair can't get a copy of the fucking letter that's about to get read he's right. about to perjure himself without knowing about this recording that happened between him and Pash and then, yeah when Oppenheimer has to say well if you have a recording of me and a transcript then I will agree that you said I said it I'll believe what you said yeah if I can't hear it back sure why not and out of all the people that were part of the Manhattan Project it's yeah. only Rami Malek and Matthew Modine that are willing to speak up for him and uh-huh. like it's one in each of these trials too Matthew Modine's the only one really on this side of aisle that's actually sticking up for him from a scientific perspective and then mm-hmm. Rami Malek's doing the same thing over in the, the Senate hearing when Rami Malek arrives for the hearing the camera cuts to him and his eyes light up like <laughs> like oh, Rami right. Malek the actor is thinking I get to talk now yeah. oh I'm on camera now yeah <laughs> and I love Aaron Reich basically fist pumping in the seat when Strauss gets his called out for his bullshit yes. it's so fucking good the subtext of the judges like as Hill's reading his statement the judges are like people don't like Strauss because he's, he's so tough dick. and good at his job right yeah yeah <laughs> no it's because he's a dick and Hill's like nah man like he sucks he's a fucking <laughs> <laughs> he sucks so fucking hard <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, at the same time, you've got Benny Safty being like, I don't really trust Oppenheimer. Yeah. All because he put a pause in your development on your fucking super bomb that you're going to get anyway. Like, they're all just petty as fuck. Yeah. yeah. Teller says, like, I wouldn't work with him now. Yeah. I think he kind of fucking sucks. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I've never seen him be disloyal to the United States. But, yeah. you know. I don't like him. But like, what does Rob have to gain from this? Because we find out that Strauss appoints him and everybody else in this fucking room against Oppie. But like, what do you think he offered Rob? Like, maybe if I get into this cabinet position, I can bring you onto my team as well. Like, oh, maybe probably something along those lines. Jason Clark is fucking vindictive in this fucking movie. (laughs) I think that they were like, we got a zealot, right? (laughs) Like, we got the guy who's going to destroy him no matter what. If we tell him that this guy is even worn red before, he's gonna set. I'm on fire. It's fucking wild, man. And to know that, like, Oppie was loyal to all these people even after all this just petty bullshit. Like, yeah. he doesn't, he shakes Teller's hand. He I doesn't know. give up Chevier's name until he's finally forced to. And, like, dude, I think this is after this, but whatever. When Emily Blunt refuses to shake Teller's hand, yeah. I love it. I love that. That's when Ludwig's little two note horn drown comes out, too. Oh, yeah. it's so fucking good. <laughs> that really happened. Yeah. And supposedly, Teller, like, left the room sobbing. As you fucking should. (laughs) As you fucking should, (laughs) Betty Safty. But anyways... Einstein steps out of the shadows like he's fucking Nick Fury. Oh my god. I wrote, so like, I wrote Einstein is Batman in this. Like a, ca- a car literally drives by and he's behind it like he's Jason fucking Bourne. Yeah. But like Einstein is such a good, like, it's such a smart idea to put him there even though he wasn't this involved. Yeah. Of like, look, they did the same shit to me. Right. I created this equation that proved that there is a system beyond what we're known and you opened the door even further and created this atomic bomb. They're going to do to you exactly what they did to me. Mm-hmm. They're going to give you awards, but it's not for you. It's for them to pat themselves on the back and to excuse themselves of all the ridiculing and destroying of your life that they do. Mm-hmm. They'll feed you salmon and potato salad like they did me. The specificity of that line is so, so fucking funny. good. It's so funny. It's so good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is where we, we're kind of getting towards the end here. Yeah. I still got a ton of notes, but Strauss is denied his cabinet position because of Hill's testimony. Mm-hmm. And I love that Aaron Wright, before he tells him, he's like, am I about to get my cabinet position or is this about to be the most humiliating moment of my life? <laughs> yeah. And it's so good because he accepts. He's like, I'm denied, right? And he goes, yep. All right. <laughs> this is also the bit where Alden Ehrenreich references Kennedy like he's like an X-Men character. <laughs> oh, I was going to say it's like Gary Oldman at the end of Batman Begins. He's like, oh, it's a senator. He's got a taste for the theatrics like you. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you worried about escalation? Nolan loves these little fucking cheeky reveals but he I gotta does. tell you this one got me a good fucking laugh in the theater dude. It made me laugh really hard. Yeah. He's a real coxman this yeah. senator. But yeah no like Strauss just erupts. He's like Oppie did all this shit. He played the fucking martyr. He thought he was so fucking important and of course this is gonna be the clip they play at the Oscars. Oh like, my god. There's no question. Be. Oh 100%. Yeah. And he tells him he's like he turned Einstein against me and I remember <laughs> goes have you ever thought about the possibility that maybe they weren't talking about you at that moment? That right. like maybe they were talking about something that was actually important and Strauss has apparently never considered that possibility never considered it no of course not yeah. never crossed his fucking mind it's that classic Don Draper I don't think about you at all moment. exactly yeah. I don't think about you at fucking all <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and then, man, yeah, just seeing Strauss try and convince him that, like, there must be something else to this. He's like, no, you just fucking suck. Like, <laughs> it's, it's so fucking good. Like, I love that. When he opens the door for Robert Downey Jr. Yep. And RDJ puts on that, like, big shit-eating grin yep. the second there's a camera in his face. Yep. It tells you everything you need to know about him. And so he gets denied for his cabinet position at the same time that Oppie gets denied for his security clearance. Mm-hmm. And I do love that he calls Kitty up and tells her, don't bring in the sheets. Yeah. Like, it's a good little callback. And again, like this man already endured so much just with his own personal battle with this thing. Mm -hmm. And to know that now he's being, you know, ridiculed in this, like this national, even global scale Mm -hmm. of like this man's not stable at his job. He can't be given the security clearance. We don't care what you think anymore. Right. Even Lyndon Johnson pinning a fucking medal to his chest is not enough. (laughs) It's not enough. And we cut back to that meeting with Einstein on the lake, finally in color, by the way, for the first time. Mm-hmm. And seeing those raindrops across the lake, he's thinking about that chain reaction possibly. And there was a good moment too earlier where Borden introduces himself to Oppie and says, you know, I was a pilot in World War One, and I remember being in my plane one time and coming back at night and seeing this B-52 rocket shoot across the sky. Mm-hmm. And it was a profound moment for me. And in this moment, he talks to Einstein. He says, hey, you know, when I came to you with those calculations, we thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. And Einstein goes, yeah, I remember. What of it? And he goes, the last line of the movie, which is, again, it's a ground shaking fucking moment. Mm-hmm. He says, I believe we did. Oof. And the implications are so fucking scary. Yeah. And if you're not affected by the ending of this movie, I think it's one of two things. You're either naive or stupid. Yeah. (laughs) There is no in between. It is a horrific fucking implication because Mm -hmm. we see Oppie in this pilot seat, the same one that Borden was in, and seeing not one rocket fly across him, not two, Mm -hmm. but like 20. We cut to the fields full of warheads. Yeah. Yeah. All shooting off into the atmosphere. We see the world just engulfed in fucking flames. Yeah. And it just he closes his eyes and we cut the black what I've done. <laughs> God damn it this is where the pessimist in me sees a sentiment at the end of this movie and goes yeah we're fucked yeah this is done yeah we did it we're fucking over good job we're fucking doomed yeah i got nothing positive to say we're fucking done mm-hmm. <laughs> so i don't know man like it's it was uh, earth shattering dude yeah. I, I can't over express how much the ending of this movie works and apparently nolan foresaw this ending in his dreams mm. went and wrote it down and said he didn't deviate from writing it down on that notepad it's the right ending for the movie it Absolutely. is a hundred percent the right ending even if it's not a real meeting that really happens like mm-hmm. einstein had to be persecuted himself at his time mm-hmm. and now it's Oppenheimer's time and until someone else maybe teller needs a movie where he experiences <laughs> the same thing but sure. until we build an even bigger bomb i think this is it man i I don't know, man. This this was a lot. Yeah. I can't fucking deal with it. <laughs> I'm glad we could help you work through it, bud. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is... It's really what we're here for. The opposite of therapy. Ooh. This is the opposite of therapy. I feel like Rambo in First Blood. Like, I'm just <laughs> dealing with this shit in real time. This man just compared himself to fucking Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both have the same physique, I like to think. But oh, uh, yeah, for sure. If we're talking about Copland. <laughs> I was like, I haven't seen Dustin in person in a while, but I seem to remember. <laughs> it hasn't gotten any better, I'll tell you one thing. But... Um, <laughs> How short are your shorts right now? Oh, they're pretty fucking short. But yeah, man, that's that's fucking Oppenheimer. Um, we are running so long, and I'm I don't apologize for it. No, this is a this is a movie that deserves to be talked about for as long as its runtime is. I mean, we can match the fucking runtime. Let's mm-hmm. go, boys. I think we're going to. Is there any final notes before we drop over to Prop Cop? No, I feel pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, fucking. No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm already exhausted, so let's get over there before it's too late. Hearing that little theme after that conversation just feels so (laughs) fucking weird. (laughs) I have to imagine that there's probably a couple people listening to our show for the first time Mm because they're looking up Oppenheimer, especially with assuredly the amount of Oscars it's won. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a topic of conversation for quite some time. So if you're new to the show, let me tell you about Prop Cop. Prop Cop is a segment here where we're looking at all of the props, Mm -hmm. all the physically tangible items in the movie Oppenheimer. Well. Well, what? Let's be honest. We don't pick props half the fucking time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyway, we're each going to pick one for ourselves to own, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and go first. Uh-huh. I want the uh, the table with the centerpiece and the map. Mm. Like, I feel like that map that they draw on, it's so funny when they take away that centerpiece finally, and like, you see that there's a map underneath it. Oh, yeah. That's kind of bone chilling. <laughs> like, now we're talking about the war room here. This is Dr. <laughs> Strangelove. 
Nathan, what do you want? I want uh, Josh Hartnett's aviators from the Trinity test scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love those little orange glasses. <laughs> They're rad. Mally, what do you want? Well, first off, you're both fucking idiots Ooh. because... You want the bomb. <laughs> So that was my original choice, <laughs> but then it occurred to me, all three of us are technically planning weddings right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to take the fucking centerpiece, oh. <laughs> save a little money. Mm -hmm. Say a little prayer for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's talk about bit part mm -hmm. because uh, there's a lot of people in this movie. So why not add three more <laughs> bit part is where we are going to cast ourselves in the movie. Like, obviously, it's kind of too late now, but we can dream, right? Sure. Dream a little dream. You got mine locked in, boys. What do you want to be, Mally? Oh, I am 100 percent the dude that's just vomiting his guts out. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think that might have been Fermi because mm. I think he was the guy that was taking bets on whether they were going to ignite the atmosphere or not. And it looked like him. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I could be wrong about that, but I would also take those bets sure sure my first pick was going to be i wrote down asshole with the bongos <laughs> and then i realized that was just That's jack, jack Quaid. Quaid. <laughs> yeah Nathan, who do you want to be? In that scene, there is uh, a woman who is just sobbing yeah. in the middle of the cheering crowd, yeah. and that was just so effective. I, I would I'd do that. Put me in a dress. I could see you crying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both of those characters, it is interesting because, like, they could be played in so many different ways. Like, the guy puking alone, it could be that guy's puking because he is horrified. He's yeah. puking because he's celebrated too hard and he's drunk. Right. Like, there's so many different ways you could interpret that. Oh, I mean, they did say the bar always open. They did right. say that. That's a good point. <laughs> Look. I want to be Josh Peck's character. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> I know he's got lines. He's not really named in terms of like a scientist. I don't believe. Like, I don't think they give his character an actual name, but I just want to be the guy with the hand over the button, man. Yeah. Should things go tits up, I want my trembling hand right there <laughs> on the camera. Yeah, you could just be the hand. That's and, fine. Because you know that was a pickup shot. I'll be the hand model. Just uh -huh. that, That'd be a good little part for me. I could do that. There you go. All right, boys, I don't envy you, but uh, we're going to talk about the silver lining. We're going to fucking do it mm. for 2023's Oppenheimer. Who is brave enough to go first? I'll go. Okay. Um, Nathan always hesitantly goes first. <laughs> We haven't destroyed the world yet. Boy, I got to tell you, I wrote down, we didn't start a chain reaction yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best silver lining. That's the most guarded silver lining I think I've ever had. Yeah, yeah. I wrote, uh, Strauss is a fucking loser. Like, he didn't get his camera <laughs> position. Fuck that guy. All my homies hate Strauss. Fuck him. So, Damn. Mally, what do you got? So I took an interesting viewpoint. Oh, boy. I'm nervous, Nath. <laughs> yeah. Someone did? Build a bigger bomb. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Teller got what he wanted. And you know what? We haven't set that bomb off yet. Right. So. I mean, from a certain point of view, it's a silver lining. Sure. <laughs> I am not happy with my decision. No, guys. you know what? I think it is kind of a good silver lining because look, we saw the devastation of what an atom bomb can do. Sure. We don't even want to see what a fucking hydrogen bomb can do. And yeah. I think that is kind of a silver lining in and of itself. Like, yeah. We did build a bigger bomb, and so far, fingers fucking crossed, we'll never fucking have to. Mm. So, it's bleak, man. It yeah. is a fucking bleak ending of a movie, so I... I'm struck for words in how to make it a silver lining, but just the fact that we haven't set off any atomic bombs since then, I think is a good thing. Bold, brave. One of the best <laughs> parts about that fifth Metal Gear Solid game, <laughs> there was- What? I know. Where are you going with this, bud? I know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A secret ending? There is a secret ending where in the game, you can build nuclear weapons, uh -huh. and because it's an online game, everyone can build nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. but there was a an achievement, a secret ending where if every Everyone in the world disassembled all their nukes. Yeah. There was a secret ending to it, and we did it. But it was only accessible because someone hacked the game yeah. and unlocked the ending. Yeah. You what? could never even get people to virtually agree to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone shits on that game because it's not finished. That is a fucking brilliant game. Yeah. <laughs> and Kojima is a fucking god. I don't give a shit. That dude knew what the fuck he was doing. And the fact that even in a simulation, we won't have complete, like, Disarmament? Disarmament, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, now more than ever, we need a pick-me-up, fellas. <laughs> On every episode <laughs> yeah. of the show we do, we'd like to give you a alternative movie to watch in conjunction with Oppenheimer, something you double feature with it as a pick-me-up to balance things out. Because look, if you walk away going, 
yeah, it's a great movie at the end of Oppenheimer. You're not weeping in your hands. I can't relate <laughs> to you, but what is a movie people should watch after Oppenheimer? I went with a 1966's Batman the Movie, oh, uh, right. a film in which Adam West runs around and says, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. <laughs> uh-huh. That's a good pick. Mally, what are you doing? I went the same route as Nathan. I went Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> <laughs> I truly, I remember when that movie came out and I was like, I cannot believe the third act is Batman just can't get rid of a bomb. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. So this movie, you know, it revolves around weapons of mass destruction sure. and just a bunch of people being dicks. Mm. Uh-oh. So I'm choosing a film that also deals with something large, impressive, and powerful. Oh and it's also filled with a bunch of dicks. Boogie Nights? 1997's Boogie Nights. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Bravo. Bravo fucking oh. Bravo. I can't believe Nathan called that. <laughs> Nicely done. Look, I was going to go with Barbie because it makes the most sense. Sure. You know, Barbenheimer is a, I feel like a once in a lifetime opportunity, but I've already suggested that as a pick me up this season. So I feel like I need to do some homework after this movie and go back and rewatch another Nolan movie that I didn't quite give the time of day. Mm-hmm. And we've talked about it already, but I feel like if you want something... Because this movie is so fucking heady. It is all serious. It is all above the shoulder shit. Mm -hmm. If you want something that's just mindlessly stupid that you can just turn your brain off, go watch fucking Tenet. (laughs) There you go. Wow. Wow. Okay. How do you really feel, bud? I really did not like Tenet. I got (laughs) to say, but again, I've only seen it once. I'm going to try and give it a second time, but I'm actually going to do something new. I'm going to give you a companion suggestion as well. Mm. If you watched Oppenheimer and you're like, okay, this is interesting in terms of like the discussions around it, the moral ambiguity, Mm -hmm. and you want to see like truly like what this world would look like if things didn't turn out all that great there is a movie called threads Mm. that i believe the uk produced yeah it is a realistic depiction of what would happen if a nuke were to go off and it may be a future episode boys it is the most devastating fucking movie i've ever seen that's what i've heard it is tough yeah it is tough to watch but it is a great fucking movie so if you want more movies about nuclear weapons and what that looks like enjoy (laughs) but it's uh prepare yourself that's all i gotta say Mm -hmm. i'm gonna ask the obvious question here that i already know the answer to but do we recommend a little movie from last year called oppenheimer do we recommend it yes sir yeah absolutely yeah i think this is without question the best movie for as far back as i can remember honestly (laughs) i'd put this up against any best picture winner of like the past decade when did uh sonic the hedgehog 2 come out (laughs) you know what that's a good question Uh I think it got released post Oscar, so like people forgot about it by the time the award nominations started coming out. Isn't that always the way? <laughs> That's always the worst. You hate to see that happen. I'm trying to think if I know anyone like in my close friend group that like didn't see this movie, but I can't really think of anyone. Yeah, everybody fucking saw it, man. Everybody's seen it at this point. But uh, I said already, this is his magnum opus, man. This is Nolan's masterpiece. Mm. And if he decided I'm going to retire right now, I would fucking stand up and cheer this man. I'm like, mm-hmm. you did it. You won movies. Congratulations. <laughs> you won movies. And I'm kind of surprised because like I said again, I enjoyed this movie the first time I watched it. I loved it. But mm-hmm. on this rewatch, I'm like, no, this is like something special. Yeah. Like this is a movie that we get once in like a decade, maybe even two. Yeah, it's great. I think it's a great movie. That's also a warning. Yeah. That we all need to fucking heed very seriously. So. That's all I got for Oppenheimer, fellas. Is there any final thoughts, any final words before we uh, wrap up here? I mean, until somebody builds a better podcast. Oh, that's not even an until. They have. (laughs) Trust me. (laughs) Prove it. Just fucking sign on to iTunes, man. (laughs) (laughs) All right, boys. So we're we're post- we're post Oscars. Yeah. We're post hashtag Sweepenheimer, I think, as you coined, Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <damn it>. Boys. <laughs> what a what a night. What a night. The stars were out. Yeah. Stars are back. Stars are back. We were live <laughs> texting each other. We were. This whole fucking Oscar thing. <laughs> but also weirdly. I don't know what was going on with the various feeds we were watching because I think Mally was in the next day. Yeah, Mally was like at another time zone, like literally with the performances and everything. I'm watching the first category being read and Mally's like, this Batman bit is hilarious. <laughs> Why am I getting shit? I was watching it live, fuckers. You were. I was streaming it on YouTube TV and uh-huh. I... I had to pause it at one point for like 30 seconds and I came back and I was like, oh shit, I don't see a button that's like, go to live. 
five. I'm just going to be 30 seconds behind. Okay. Sure. And then, yeah, in the group chat, Mally would be like, oh, what a win for so-and-so. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not there yet. Like, <laughs> I streamed it on, I think it was called Fubo TV. <laughs> Fubo. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody watched this shit on ABC. <laughs> no. On cable. So <laughs> I signed up and phew, didn't even make it through the seven day free trial. That shit was over in three hours. <laughs> That's what I did in YouTube TV. As soon as the awards were over, I'm like, all right, let me go cancel this trial real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you and I just taking on capitalism, just fucking head on. I'm so sorry to derail us immediately, but Mally mentioning Fubo <laughs> reminded me of some late breaking news since our last recording. Mm. Is Fubu back? Fubu is Fubu back. Is back. <laughs> Tubi has rebranded, yeah. has a new logo and a theme song that plays when you start up. And yeah. I, I don't think they're doing too much. <laughs> Go back. Scale it back, Tubi. Yeah. <laughs> is it called Fubu? <laughs> <laughs> it's still called Tubi. Oh. They're producing a original programming too now I know. you saw what? what happened to netflix don't do it to me it's a downward spiral don't do it nothing yeah. original leave your logo at helvetica font mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> don't get too fancy with it to me you're reaching to me don't do it don't do it honestly to me if you want to change something just put it in comic sans like commit <laughs> to the bit you know what to me you're really leaning into the lewis strauss here you're you're flying too close to the sun just <laughs> wheel it back into the shadows didn't you hear what he said the power stays there you also go back <laughs> one other update <laughs> my fiance while i'm recording this decided to take a bath and watch wonka <laughs> five minutes in she's texted me wonka sucks <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the live update ashley i love that thank you ashley i've been drinking <laughs> <laughs> the middle of the week <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been a long one we're not recording at the normal time we record no, it's, it's like late at night it's late on a wednesday <laughs> this is our lives uh. I'm in the middle of working. I just stepped away. The season's <laughs> over. I had mentally already moved on from this shit. I know. I know. No, so this is going to be, uh, we're going to breeze through these categories here and just give our, our thoughts on it. Sure. I got to say, this was the best year my predictions have ever been. I was only off by three, I think. You know what was wild was, so we did, I went to an Oscars party and we all voted on, you know, the different categories. And I was trying to be strategic and voting for what I thought would win yep. versus what my heart said would win. That's always the problem. And I was pleasantly surprised by a great number of these categories yeah uh i would just like to say based on the text chain from that night you were not at an oscar party you were at, like a fucking oscar like ted talk or something i was at no an actual text you sent me was yes yeah, sorry it keeps getting interrupted by speeches <laughs> what well I, I discovered that the feed what kind of party the feed was still running while the speeches were going on so what i don't fuck? know what it was like i truly do not know what the delay was but we were at a uh we were at a fundraiser for a lgbt BTQ uh, film festival. So it was good speeches happening, but every once in a while I'd be like, guys, Danny DeVito's on screen. Can we? <laughs> was that allowed in Florida? That's a great point. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Bringing it back to Oppenheimer, you were like, you're like, y- y'all are communists, basically. <laughs> I suit up, I put my pipe in my mouth, and then I say gay. <laughs> you know, real quick, yeah. I don't know for the next season if you're going to go to the same party. They are aware that there are commercials that they could be doing these speeches during, right? That's what they were doing. Oh, yeah, okay. but every once in a while it would run a little long because oh, yeah. you know people are talking about very important shit because yeah florida is uh terrifying to live in yeah it's on fire yeah actively just so you know no one got played off by the music <laughs> <laughs> well they they did but it was murder on the dance floor and so they oh, all just thought it was oh, part boy. of it that was a thing somebody on twitter pointed out is thank god barry cogan was at the wine skipping across that stage naked <laughs> and it was john cena instead because that weird little freak loves getting naked lately <laughs> and strangely uh the alt-right was like yeah take that you humiliate Humiliated cuck, and yeah. I'm like, yeah, everyone <laughs> celebrate his amazing body. Oh, I'm so <laughs> humiliated at my six pack and cup gutters. What a humiliation <laughs> this is. Like, legitimately, <laughs> Ashley was like, is that real? And I was like, yeah, you can't fake those cum gutters. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, wait, pause. Uh-huh. You both keep using this same phrase. Uh-huh. Get on board or get out. <laughs> yeah, no, enlighten me, please. Come gutters, the V, the V, man. The what? V right above the pelvis. But when that V is like defined, like sharp, <laughs> it's a sharp, it's a steep drop. Uh-huh. <laughs> but- why is all right, here it- we go you know what i'm gonna look it up hold on <laughs> you know like when godzilla got all that shit shot into his mouth at the end of shin godzilla <laughs> yes okay it's kind of like that he did it through his cub gutters yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> All right, here we go. I'm, this is on my laptop. Wow, so here howdy. We go. Okay, <laughs> Dustin's Googling cum gutters, and well, most, <laughs> most of the results are blurred. Yeah, there you go. Those things. Wait. These right here. Yeah, that's the this little nice little V you got going here. This These are the cum gutters. Wait, I just, wait, hang on, hang on. I hold it on. <laughs> you are a grown-ass adult that keeps safe search on? You know what? I, for this result, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, now Google cum gutters feet. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, wait. <laughs> Don't no Cub Gunners Mr. Beast. Mr. Hold on. Beast. <laughs> Look, we got to speed through this shit. I'm, I'm stepping away from work. I basically told him I had to take a cigarette break. So here we go. And this is being tacked on to the already long Oppenheimer yep, episode. Yep, okay, yep, yep, okay. Cool. I will shut the fuck up. <laughs> None of this is getting cut. <laughs> All right. Who won what? I'm literally just going to go in the order that is on the Oscars website. So uh-huh. actor in a leading role, of course, went to Killian Murphy. How Woo! do you feel about that? Yes, absolutely. For me, it was between him and Giamatti. Always, always between those two. I don't necessarily understand the hate for Bradley Cooper. I don't think the maestro (laughs) is really a great performance, but people act like they've never met a theater kid before. Oh, I know. That's such a weird thing, right? Bradley Cooper's got big Nathan energy sometimes. (laughs) Maestro is fine. I just, I felt Bradley Cooper trying. Yeah. Like, I can see him being like, I want that Oscar, and like, Killian Murphy was effortless with his performance, you know what I mean? I agree. Okay, hang on real quick. Who's your number two? Giamatti. Hell yeah. Yeah. Although, I I have to say, I have not seen Russ him and I want to rectify that very soon. I actually haven't seen Rustin either. I gotta say, I'm happy with all of these actors in yeah. this category. Oh, I yeah, like no. them all. Love Coleman Domingo. An embarrassment of riches, so yeah. Moving on. <laughs> Actor in a supporting role, of course, went to Robert Downey. Yeah. Deserved, right? Oh, Sterling K, though. Sterling K, great. Really fantastic. A close second for me. Mark Ruffalo and Poor Things. Yeah. Jesus Christ, what a performance. Loved him in that. <laughs> it is one of those performances that it feels like is a once in a career career performance uh-huh. like and I, I say that as a fan of Mark Ruffalo but mm-hmm. he was channeling some other shit in that movie he was so fucking good at that <gasps> Bella God. when he literally spikes the camera and cracks up in, <laughs> in the scene and they and leave, they it, leave in the it in yeah that being said Robert De Niro also doing some career best work mm-hmm. in Killers of the Flower Moon mm-hmm. really understated but yeah I, I think this was Downey's time it was time it was definitely time the look on De Niro's face when they announced the nominees oh. he had that look of like Bro, I'm not going to win. He was like, why am I here? <laughs> the look that was on Scorsese's face all night. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Poor guy. Hey, the look on his face was, bro, am I not going to win? Am I on TikTok right now? <laughs> Scorsese was, again? That was the expression he had on his face. Yeah. He's like, again, you invite me here, nominate me for all these awards, and I don't win any? Again? <laughs> Just tell him ahead of time. It's past his bedtime. Absolutely. Yeah. That poor man. <laughs> All right, actress in the leading role. I think this one was the surprise, right? Oh, uh, this one hurt. It this did. one hurt a little bit. I do think Emma Stone is amazing. So and good. I do think if we're going strictly off of it was a gamble for Lily Gladstone to run in leading, right? Yep. Because she's in so relatively little. It's still an hour of a four hour movie, essentially. Yeah. But she's amazing in it. Like, this could have gotten to either one of them. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Like, Annette Benning, every time they cut to her, she's just happy to be there. Yeah, she's like, it's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just think it was going to come down between one of those two. And I think yeah. even Emma Stone had that realization of like, oh, shit, Lily didn't get the award. I did. Right. Like, you can kind of see that read across her face. You can see it in her face. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. She yeah, yeah. Uh, supposedly told someone backstage when they asked her if she had a speech, she was like, I'm not going to win. Yeah. Real quick, I do want to note, I love the way they presented the nominees yes. for all the acting categories, like bringing out the former winners. That was dope. I feel like they haven't done that since 2009, right? It's been With a the, the Heath Ledger year. It's it's been a minute, yeah. I think you got to do that and do the clips, though. Agreed. Like, I, I need, I need both. I know it's going to take longer, but I feel like this was a relatively short show, anyway. So, so that's something I think. Like, this was one of the best produced Oscars in years. Yeah. I think. Like, yeah. I think there was not really a dull moment in the whole broadcast. I kind agree. Of, I mean, real quick, shout out Kimmel. Uh, yeah, not my favorite. <laughs> yeah, he didn't do that. Like, it wasn't bad. It's fine. He kept it moving, but I okay, gotta say, but compared to 
I think he did better than Rock. Yeah, one hundred percent. My biggest takeaway this year was if John Mulaney doesn't host the Oscars next year, they're right? out of their fucking minds. Oh right? my god, Mulaney's bit was gold. It was really good. I just want someone who likes movies, movies? to be the one. Yes, yep. <laughs> presents them at the Oscars. Yep. I'm tired of the movies are too long jokes. I'm tired of the animation are just for kids jokes. Well, like Chevy Chase hosted the Oscars once, and people like always kind of say that he sort of cut himself out of making a return gig when he came out and called everyone in the audience a bunch of phonies and that was kind of <laughs> Kimmel's whole tenor for this performance mm-hmm. I don't know it's weird you can do roast bits here and there but not for the whole fucking runtime of the show yeah anyway Sandra Holler fucking amazing in Anatomy of a Fall agreed so there you go actress in a supporting role this was the first award of the night and I was like if this doesn't go to Divine there's no fucking hope for this this whole award show so, yeah right. well deserved and a lovely speech too oh, oh my god her speech brought me speech. to tears she brought Giamatti to tears too yeah and for the rest of the night every time any woman was on stage they were like by the way Jodie fucking Foster is here yeah everyone put some <laughs> respect on her name she's having the best year in years like, there was that and then there was also uh, just so you know my publicist I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. Him real quick. <laughs> Thought that was a good joke. <laughs> also, I learned a lot about British Mother's Day. Oh, uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. Did anyone catch Giamatti's cufflinks, by the way? Yeah, the in out and out. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I saw that on Twitter later. Yeah. The man stays stunting. He does. Animated feature. I'm happy when to boy in the hair, and I'm glad 2D animation won again. Yeah. In the face of so much 3D animation. Surprised it didn't go to Spider Man, honestly, just because the Academy seems to love Pixar and it loves to love these Sony animated movies too. Elemental, I didn't love. I've not like seen it. Nimona or robot dreams across the spider verse is half a movie mm. that but i do think the different styles of animation working together is so impressive yeah boy in the heron is not my favorite of the miyazaki canon mm-hmm. but it is it does feel very much if he hadn't retired it's like thematically the perfect period at the end of his career so yeah. i get why they gave it to him as well yeah absolutely Cinematography, Oppenheimer. Again, no surprise there to me. Yep. Nope. Costume design, poor things. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm surprised Barbie didn't get as much love. Yeah, it was between Barbie and poor things in this category, yep. but yep. Bella's dresses are just everything. Incredible. Incredible. Directing, finally, going to Nolan for Oppie. It was time. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I guess we can kind of skip over the documentaries, right? I mean, let's fucking list the winners, yeah. damn. Sure, 20 Days in Maripol, it's definitely something I want to see now, this yeah. documentary feature. First uh, Ukrainian Oscar. That was nice. That was my takeaway was like, boy, I, mi- I slept on a bunch of documentaries this year. Yeah, yeah. same, honestly. Like, I really want to see The Last Repair Shop now. Uh, yeah, documentary short, The Last Repair Shop. That little girl, such a sweetheart, loved uh, her. What a queen, right? Mm-hmm. Film editing, there was no competition was going to go on anyone other than Jennifer Lame. Agreed. Like, I love Thelma Shoemaker, but Killers is a much more conventional movie than Oppie is, so. I agree. International features, Zone of Interest winning, not really surprised there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Kind of annoyed how the Oscars are treating uh, Jonathan Glazer's speech. Yeah. But yeah. The less we say about that, probably the better. Yep. Makeup and hairstyling, poor things. Yeah. Again, no surprise, I don't think. Original score for Ludwig, of course, yeah. for Oppie. Hell I mean, again, yeah. there's no competition here, so they go. I agree. I, you know, and I, I do love Jerskin Fendrick's Poor Things score. Yeah. I love how it's super discordant at the beginning, becomes more lush as it goes along. And like, it's a great narrative score, but Oppenheimer is is just like such an astounding feat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Best original song, what was I made for? Again, I think this is the only one in this category that was even worth a damn, to be honest with you. Granted, the I'm Just Kid performance was amazing. Incredible. Oh, I guess I should say I like the Killers of the Flower Moon, the the Native song. That was great. I was puzzled by the Diane Warren song. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I mean, good thing about that song, very short. 30 Thank seconds long. And uh, apparently Diane Warren threw a temper tantrum during the I ceremony. Read that. I read <laughs> that. Did not win. Did not hear about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. I will do some giggling later. <laughs> Best picture. My eyes see Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> It was wild seeing Pacino essentially, like, repeat himself from the Game Awards last year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was just like, like, he just woke up from a nap. He's like, where am I? Oh, yeah. Uh, Oppie, I guess. Uh, I'm going back home. You know, he <laughs> says that the producers told him not to read all the nominees again, but I don't believe it. I because don't believe when, that either. <laughs> because when the orchestra starts playing, he goes, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> 
He says that. It's so funny. Again, there's probably no real competition here. I mean, I love most of the movies in this category, but there was no way Oppie wasn't winning. To me, I don't know. It was between Oppenheimer and Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. But I, I, yeah, Oppenheimer is just, it's something else, man. Yeah, it was Oppenheimer all day. I think, like I said in the episode, I think Oppie's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Sure. And Killers is great, but it's also what we've kind of seen from Scorsese before. We've seen that story before. Yeah, exactly. Production design, poor things. Barbie was the only other one. Agreed. Maybe Napoleon, but glad it went to poor things. That movie just looks incredible. Yeah. Animated shorts, war's over. I just, the whole time <laughs> that Yoko Ono's son was up on stage, I was like, he looks so familiar to me. And then when they <laughs> mentioned his name, I was like, oh, that's why. Yeah, <laughs> Sean Ono Lennon. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but this short felt to me like when they gave Kobe that Oscar for his short film. Oh, sure. And uh, I didn't like that one because it was just basically a commercial for the NBA. So I don't know if I'll watch this one, but uh, there you go. Live action short, Wes Anderson getting his first Oscar, yeah. like a boss not even showing up. <laughs> I was so happy about this. Mm-hmm. Henry Sugar rules. Sound. This was one of the ones that I was out on because I put down Oppie and went to Zone of Interest. This really surprised me. This yeah, was interesting. It, but pleasantly surprised me. Yeah. The sound in Zone, I will say, is haunting for sure yeah. because there's scenes where like the whole focus of it is the sound and you're just looking at basic things like someone walking through a garden. Yeah. And then like you just hear screams going on right. in the background. So, but also. Also, like, it didn't help their case that when they were showing the different clips, they showed the bleachers scene from Oppenheimer. And yeah. I'm just like, well, Jesus Christ, that's the scariest scene of the year. Yeah. They picked weird clips they for did. some yes. of the... Yeah. Visual effects. Godzilla! Gotta say. Boys, we won one. Yeah. Godzilla about his when he gets one and only Oscar nomination was a dream come true. Godzilla's first Oscar. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I'm surprised they didn't go to some bullshit like Guardians, to be honest with you. Because, yeah. again, the Academy loves their fucking Marvel and MCU shit when it comes to the visuals. But that was a nice one. <laughs> the only thing I thought might take it from Godzilla was Creator. Which I still haven't seen, but I'm eager to see. It looks good. I mean, dude, the visual effects on Creator are incredible. Sure. Yeah. But... I was really pulling for Godzilla. Me Glad too. That one. Yeah. Agreed. Adapted screenplay. Kind of a surprise going to American fiction. Yeah. I thought for sure it was going to go to to Oppie or Barbie. Same. But, uh, I'm fucking pumped that American fiction won. It was a great speech. Yes. Great speech by Court Jefferson. Loved his speech. Absolutely. And uh, last category here, original screenplay going to Anatomy of Fall. Again, not a surprise right. to me. But uh, I was really pulling for past lives same. in at least one category. Me because too. I, I, I just, was really pulling for May, December. <laughs> great script. That's such a good script, but boy, what a movie. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, that movie is one of those where, like, the only reason it works is because every element works so well, right? Like, yeah. that script with bad direction falls apart and vice versa. So easily. Boys, just wait till we start putting together the schedule for next season. Oh, I'm waiting oh, for it, for <laughs> sure. Uh-huh. All right, so just to do a quick recap, since we Googled Cub Cutters, <laughs> we did one, two. On a Wednesday. <laughs> Mr. Beast feed. Three. <laughs> Four. I think it was seven total. Five. I think you're right. Just double checking. Uh, yeah, six and seven. Yep, won seven Oscars. Incredible. Hell yeah, brother. I think out of ten, right? Was yeah. it ten nominations? I think so. I'll be sweet, baby. Yeah. I told y'all. No one ever argued with you, DC. Why are you <laughs> trying to <laughs> like- I told you. I told you guys. We know. We agreed with you. How do we do it for do- doing it all the categories? Do sweep. There you go. I mean, you just keep it simple. All right, to sign off of here, because we got to get out of here, we're going to do- Cum gutters. Cum gutters, Mr. B. Mr. Oh, Mr. B. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Let's see what we get. Mr. Beast Burger, try not to come challenge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, look. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah, he's looking all right. He doesn't have him yet, but he's working on it. <laughs> the mister is covering the beast. What are we What are we doing here? <laughs> You're right. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's Oppenheimer. And fellas, with that, season eight is in the fucking bag. Boy. We did it. Or I'm sorry, excuse me, season seven. Yes. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So on the horizon is season eight. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we got to do a little bit of housekeeping right up front. So we're wrapping up right now. And Mally mentioned earlier, but we're kind of at an interesting point because over the next 365 days, all three of us have weddings that we are orchestrating. Sorry, you said 365 days. Oh, no. (laughs) You started getting flashbacks? Getting getting flashbacks. flashbacks. (laughs) Room started vibrating. (laughs) Buddy, just wait until next season. Oh, boy. (laughs) We going back to the well on that one. (sighs) You know what I mean by well. (laughs) We're kind of at a standstill. And so 
We're not too sure when we're going to come back. Because we're going to get married to our wives. <laughs> His wives, their <laughs> wives. And uh, we don't know. Normally we'd come back in September, but uh, my fucking wedding's in September <laughs> and sure. marriage is in October. And uh, Nathan, you're still penciling in a date, I believe, in April of 2025. Mm-hmm. So, like, we don't know. But uh, we've already discussed potentially splitting season eight in two, so you don't have to wait too long. Mm-hmm. We might breaking back. Mm-hmm. We might pull the season 5A, 5B, but with season eight here. But uh, we potentially maybe coming back at the end of the year. Mally just reminded me of one note that I did miss, mm. which is uh, at one point, Oppenheimer says, when I was a kid, I thought if I could find a way to combine physics in New Mexico, I'd have it made. And I was like, this guy, <laughs> R.I.P. Oppenheimer, you would have loved, loved Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we don't know exactly when we're going to come back for season eight. Mm-hmm. However, I will say this, stay tuned to this feed because mm-hmm. in the off season, I am going to drag Mally and Nathan back, probably one of them kicking and screaming to do some <laughs> bonus episodes. Uh-huh. wonder which one <laughs> we've got a couple already planned or at least i do and one they've been threatening me with for like two seasons now quite some time i'm legitimately trying to think of what we've been threatening <laughs> nathan with We've got some extra, you know, listening that you can do. Mm. So you've also got Nathan's other podcast you can listen to, the mm-hmm. AITP Comics podcast. Close enough. AITP, right? AIPT. AIPT. <laughs> I can't fucking spell. Did I mention that? It's all good. We've also got, you know, the podcast that he does with uh, him and his future wife. Thank you. You've got uh, Southern Haunts that she does, and you've got, oh, that's a scary movie that you can go back and listen to. Uh-huh. By the time this comes out, Priscilla and I will have already recorded at least one episode of our show. We must be missing something. Are you starting with the episode we are we are <laughs> oh i'm bleeping that out so no one knows until we drop it but yeah that's what we're starting with no i know i know you absolute madman but uh, that will be coming out very soon so stay tuned this fiend and i'll make an announcement when that happens mm-hmm. and uh nathan you and i are getting back in the studio yeah the sophomore album we'll see if it's a slump or not <laughs> we're working on <laughs> the next fever the rage album there's so much to look forward to in the silver linings family i ain't got shit going on so y'all can leave me the fuck alone <laughs> i was gonna ask if you got anything going on but uh, even if i did i I wouldn't tell (laughs) y'all. So yeah, season eight, look for that on the horizon. And I got to tell you, if you're doing the math, season eight will have episode 200. Mm -hmm. So... Do we only watch the first two thirds of 300? Mm. <laughs> this is what we should have done for episode 100. Watch the first third of it for that one. <laughs> episode 200. Guys, I already said I'm not good at algebra. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's season seven, boys. We did it. We had a lot of uh, scheduling issues. We had a lot of other issues in terms of recording just in general, but we finally did it and it's in the bag. I didn't have any scheduling issues. I showed up to every episode I could. <laughs> <laughs> not a single one. Any last words before we get out of here for the foreseeable future? Pop goes the weasel. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> so say we all. Pop goes the weasel. Well, I was so thrilled to do another season of this show with you fellas, and I can't wait for season eight. Yeah, man. So if you haven't already, subscribe, rate, please leave us some feedback if you haven't already. And uh, to the guy who left an iTunes review of our show and gave us one star and said, one of the guys says literally too much. <laughs> they say, you literally say it every sentence. That's literally not how that word works. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks for the review, I guess. Hoisted by your own petard. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to give us some feedback, you can do that in whatever podcast aggregate you're listening to us right now on. Mm-hmm. You can also email us at the Silver Lines Playlist at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, which is a good idea if you want to hear those announcements for those bonus episodes and things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can also check out our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Silver Linings Playlist. I really got to start fucking checking out our social media. I'm late on all this <laughs> news. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it's mostly a bunch of nerds arguing. That's really what it's boiled down to. But- I'm talking talking about the shit you're fucking telling them about. Oh, yeah, you should tune up to your own show. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know Nathan had other podcasts. <laughs> so, <laughs> until season eight, I'll say rest in peace, Oatmeal, and old Oppie himself, maybe? Sure. And uh, I won't end on a somber note. I'll say rest in peace in general to those affected uh, by World War II. Yeah. And as always, bring in the sheets. I am become Excelsior, destroyer <laughs> of podcasts. <sighs> Excelsior! 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 Look it up!
Hello, YouTube. If you've made it this far, thanks. Could you do us one more favor? Could you hit those like and subscribe buttons? Maybe leave us a comment on what you think of the show. We'd really appreciate it. Bye.